This is Jocko Podcast number 91 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And we are rolling straight into Q&A today. So questions from the interwebs. Echo Charles, go. Go. Okay, first question. Jocko, I've just finished About Face, the book. Amazing book. Interested how you modeled your style on Hackworth, though. Hack was a renegade and always bending the rules to break to the breaking point. But in extreme ownership, you talk about, for example, not pushing back on higher command when it came to Iraqi troops. Have listened to podcast two, but was hoping you could go into it a bit more. Yeah. So. I guess that that's a, a good question hack he was kind of considered a renegade, but but also he was also a total company man mm-hmm. You, you got to realize that there's that dichotomy there. There's a guy that hack loved the army mm-hmm. He loved the army. He wanted his uniform would look super squared away He followed all the rules and regulations that and he supported the leadership all the time when the leadership was right mm-hmm. and that's what makes him a good renegade in my opinion, and I was very much the same way. I was all about the Navy, <laughs> you know? I was all about the teams. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Tony, you know what Tony used to say? Uh, it was a little thing we got going in TU Bruiser that spread around, but of course it came from Tony first, which was all Navy all the time. <laughs> We'd just be joking about, you know, I think, I don't know what originally caused it, but like guys would make fun of me because I would wear like jungle boots or Dan or boots out to on Liberty with a pair of like old jeans. Yeah, because when you're when you're like that kind of old Just raised in the teams. You don't even know any different and you're like, oh, well, I'm going out and I need to wear shoes Cool. Where's my jungle boots? (laughs) That's what you end up like and and you're into it. You're not like you think it's good You think it's normal like this is the way things are (laughs) and and so I supported the teams And hack supported the army, of course. Mm -hmm. But this is the thing. If the leadership was wrong or there was something being passed down that was wrong, and it was a big wrong. Like, if it was little, I wouldn't be like, oh, man, this is crap. They're making us wear a different pair of shorts now. Because, like, that would happen. Like, some new commanding officer would come in and change some thing, right? Mm -hmm. And some guys would go, oh, man, why we got to do that? It's like, dude, be quiet. You know, just be quiet. Yeah. You know, they're giving you new shorts. Wear the new shorts. Yeah. You know, oh, they're telling us we can't wear baseball hats anymore. Cool, don't wear baseball hats. Yeah. And some guys be go, man, they're tra- it's, who cares? It's like mm-hmm. uh, I don't care what I'm wearing on my head. You know, mm-hmm. like oh, you want to issue us different ball caps? Fine, whatever. Mm-hmm. But then if it was a larger issue, then or or obviously if it was something that was like actually wrong, like criminally wrong or morally wrong or something like that, then yeah, I'd be like, no, we can't do that. So the reason that I didn't push back on Iraqi troops and working with Iraqi troops when we got to Ramadi was because as I looked at it, I realized that it was the right thing to do. And yes, it was going to be more dangerous. And yes, it definitely took us out of our comfort zone. But as I explain in extreme ownership, if we didn't train those people up, if we didn't train the Iraqi soldiers and take them out and get them fighting, and get them squared away on the battlefield, then Americans would have been doing it forever. So Mm. it was the correct call was to do that. Now, I've I've talked about the same same thing. When they told us a ratio, Mm. they gave us a ratio of how many Iraqis we had to have for every one Iraqi we had to have, I don't know what, I forget what the number was, seven, or, or for every one seal we had to have seven Iraqi soldiers they, they said that mm. something like that I forget what the numbers were and I said that doesn't make sense to us because sometimes we only have ten guys to go out and I'm, there's no way I'm sending only one seal with ten Iraqi soldiers not doing mm. it need a corpsman need a radio man need a machine gunner need a leader like that that's what I need mm. so and when I pushed back because I didn't push back against ball caps and because I didn't push back against some stupid uniform change, uh, th- they were like, oh yeah, well that actually makes sense, Jocko. We don't want you to go in the field with only one seal. Mm. So I-, I would clearly push back if it was something that didn't make sense. Same thing with like the martial arts training that they had us doing in the, in the late 90s 
and early 2000s, mm-hmm. it was not good. Mm-hmm. And I was told everyone, hey, this is not smart. This is not good. Yeah. This training is dumb. We need to do other training that's better. Uh, and, and same thing, you know, things go, oh, oh, like here's another like stupid example. They wouldn't want to issue a platoon, the, the, the radios you were going to take on deployment, because they didn't want you to break them or whatever. Mm. And so they'd issue not enough radios for everyone, and so now everyone doesn't know how to operate the radios, and you're basically operationally testing the radios while you're going through your workup. So I said, hey, this is garbage. Mm. Issue everyone radios. Right. If that's how we operate, that's how we need to train. Gotcha. So in the training, they wouldn't issue the, the radios. Yeah, there was like a time period where we were low on radios, and they said, we're going to keep these radios gotcha. for deployment, and it's, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I got yeah. a good idea. Buy more radios. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, those are things I'd, I'd push back on. And, and you were always pushing back on the type of training that was going to happen and who is going to, how you're going to run the training. So, um, when something, when it made sense to push back, I pushed back, just like Hackworth did. Now, Hackworth did it on a massive scale because he eventually pushed back on the way the war in Vietnam was being run. Mm. And had I been smart enough, and the war didn't take the shift that it took, and we didn't move towards counterinsurgency, and we didn't make those adjustments that the that Colonel McFarland implemented in Ramadi. Maybe, maybe, I doubt it. Maybe I would have been smart enough to say, "Hey, we're not running this war right. We need to do something different and run up the chain of command." But, but at the time, you know, Colonel McFarland made great decisions. He mm. led. He had a great plan, a great strategy. So I was 100 percent on board. Mm. Um, but. If, you know, Hackworth, that didn't happen. They were not fighting correctly against the Vietnamese. And and they were taking massive casualties for a hill that two days later they'd give back. Mm. And so he was saying, what are you doing? And, and the other thing, you know, when he took over the hardcore battalion, uh, they were fighting for months. And they had, they had literally killed of almost no enemy. I think it was zero. I think it was actually zero enemy. Mm-hmm. And yet they had taken all kinds of casualties themselves. Mm-hmm. And so he's saying, wait, 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 this is wrong. Yeah, yeah. This is wrong. So I, I think that's that's what being a leader is. You support the stuff. You support the command. Yes, of course you support the command. When it makes sense. And as long as it makes sense. And normally it's going to make sense. You know what I mean? Normally it's going to make sense. Not like the, the admirals and the generals are saying, hey, how can we lose this war? Let's come up with a stupid strategy. No, yeah. they're doing the best they can. Mm-hmm. So it's not like it's a regular occurrence. I mean, like I said, when I was working for Car- Colonel McFarland, he was a smart guy. Yeah. He was a brilliant guy that had a great strategy. Of, I'm like, okay, awesome. I'm here to support. Um, and, and I'll tell you, when I did, and this is, I think this is important, is that even though I was kind of a renegade and I was more rebellious when I was a kid obviously I, I was a I was young when I got to the SEAL teams mm. and so you know we would push all those things that I said oh we got to do this that was me when mm. I was a E4 in the SEAL teams you know mm. what do we got to do that we should just be able to do whatever we want you yeah, know yeah, yeah. we were just stupid but as I got older I realized that you need to you know, you know come across as a renegade, quote unquote, to come across as a big rebel that doesn't, well, immediately when you go and push back on something, everyone just dismisses you. Oh yeah, Jocko, he's just a loud yeah. mouth. He just, he just pushes back against everything. He doesn't want, he just want to do everything his way. No, yeah. you want them to say, oh wow, hold on a second. If Jocko's pushing back against this, yeah. then this, this must be something wrong here because he doesn't push back against stuff. He tells the line all the time. So we should listen to him. That's what you want to build. That's what I did my best to build. And that's how I think it would be comparable to the way Hackworth led and the way that I tried to. Um, obviously, I ain't no Hackworth, but I stole as much as I could from him. And the weird thing is, I'll tell you this, I always say I stole from him, but it wasn't like I was sitting there reading the book and going, I'm gonna do what he did here. Yeah, yeah. I think it was just absorbed. Yeah, and even, yeah. even the naming of Task Unit Bruiser, like when I did it, I wasn't thinking this is what Hackworth did, but it was real obvious that that's where I got it from. Like yeah, I, yeah. I didn't think I'm going to rename this and we're going to turn this thing around based on, or not turn it around, but we're going to build this based on. No, I was like, you know what? We're not going to be Task Unit Bravo because yeah, yeah. that sounds lame. We're going to be Task Unit Bruiser because that sounds awesome. <laughs> you and, yes. and 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 then later, you know, as I look back, I'm like, oh god, that's what that's exactly what Hackworth did. I obviously stole it from him. Yeah, yeah. So appreciate it, Hack. But that's what I'd say. Be a renegade, but that should be that should be in the background. That should be in the back of your mind. Yeah. In the front of your mind should be, hey, I'm a I'm I'm a supporter of yeah. what's happening. Yeah. Kind of like the the willingness to be a re- renegade. 
If you have to. Yeah, yeah. If you have to. And believe me, I've known all kinds of good SEALs that were too renegade. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> and, just like, I'm a renegade. Yeah, they're just straight up, hey, I'm a renegade. And, and you know, that just, it, the only guys that could get away with that were guys that were so ultimately operationally squared away. Yeah, yeah. That That's people true. go, yeah, you know, he's kind of a maniac, but dude, he's really, yeah. really good and really <laughs> tactically sound and yeah. all that. And they could, they, they make that happen. Yeah. Now, as you get more and more senior, the, Homie, don't play like that yeah, anymore. Yeah. After a certain point, yeah. it's done, and you got to get, you got to play the game. That's what mm. you got to do. As you get more senior, you got to play the game. And from like your subordinates' viewpoint, if if they looked at me and go, "Oh, Jocko's just playing the game. He's just doing," yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. Because this way it gives me more ability to control everything that's going to impact you people that work for me. Mm. So yes, I'm going to play the game so you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. <laughs> So yeah, check. Yeah, man, makes sense. Next question: Jujitsu, BJJ, Jujitsu. During your time in Iraq, if you like, please paint me a picture. How to imagine a BJJ class from you as an active soldier? Did you have a gi, mats, and how would it differ from a quote unquote normal class? Um. So. Yeah, I always brought mats with me, starting with 1998, I think is when I started bringing mats with me. How do you bring mats? Do so you just be like, hey. In, in military transport, you build something called a pallet. Oh, so you get a right. big pallet, and they're they're like eight feet by eight feet. Yeah. They're pretty big. Mm. And you put stack all kinds of stuff on them. Yeah. And you know, you got your weapons. Just you got whatever your radios, you like. You got your engines. You got your motors. You got your or motors. You got your boats. Your mm. your Zodiac boats. You got paddles. You got all this. I mean, all the equipment. Mm -hmm. Everyone's personal gear is on there. Their op gear. Their body armor. It's all on these big pallets. Mm -hmm. And when you go on deployment, you'll have eight pallets. Eight of these giant pallets. And so on some of those pallets, there would be mats. So who is it up to, though? You know, you're talking about weapons and Zodiacs and so and and then yes. mats. Like who's, well, yeah. who's well, it up to? Well, well whoever's in charge, which <laughs> which <laughs> a lot okay. of times was there me. So there then it made it real easy. Yeah. And and even if it wasn't me, I mean, everybody, you know, if, if people are bringing something to help everyone get better, yeah. you know, people, oh, yeah, that's cool. So is it like no an factor. approval process? You no, know, you man. To, you you're just throw, like this is what bro, we're doing. there was guys bringing all kinds of crazy things. On oh, pallets, yeah, yeah. man. I remember right. guys. Well, you know, you guys would bring surfboards. I mean, they'd pack their surfboards on pallets. They'd yeah. pack uh, weights and squat racks and anything that you want. You know, if you're going on a six month deployment to a remote yeah. location, yeah. yeah, you're gonna you're gonna load out a squat rack Dang. and a bunch of bumper plates. Cool. And if that remote location has waves, you're packing surfboards. <laughs> If it has, so uh, if it has, you know, rock climbing, you're gonna pack rock climbing gear. Yeah, that's. The, I'm telling you, this is one of the things that it's really hard to, the SEAL teams. It's really hard to have that. I think we, I think we and the SEAL teams have that better than most people. Oh, it's yeah. just this this autonomy mm. to kind of make things happen and do kind of cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying no, no one ever gets to do that, but. You know, I, I, I don't think a regular Army unit or regular Marine Corps unit would be putting, you know, seven surfboards on their back. Yeah. So where's the so, where's the limit, though? Like, so what? Can I, let's say me, we're going, can I get a, like a TV? Can I get a TV? Oh, guys are bringing TVs. Like yeah. big screen? Yeah, TV? Yeah. 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 It just, it also depends on where you're deploying, what you're yeah. doing, what the mission is. Because, you know, my first time to Iraq, we didn't have much of any of this stuff, obviously, yeah. right? We just had our op gear, basically. Mm -hmm. And, but the second time, the second time I went to Iraq, we brought more, but we actually had to weld a squat rack. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. There's a, there's a Marine that, there's a great Marine that was with us and he ran, he manned the radios yeah. and he was just a, just an awesome guy. And he was, he was a Marine. But he was there was Marines across the river, and so he was supposed to keep continuity, and he got assigned to us. Anyways, awesome guy, and he knew how to weld. He was from a farm up in Montana or something, yeah. so he knew how to weld. And he and had the gear. And we didn't have a squat rack, and so our CBs, because there was a bunch of CBs with us oh, too. Yeah, yeah. They got they were able to like just come up with stuff. Yeah, yeah. They they <laughs> make anything happen. My 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 head CB was just could see that's. CBs build things and they also yeah. acquire things. Yeah. Let me CB put you that is way. combat C builder. It's it's uh, it 
Combat Engineer Battalion. It's oh, okay. a construction battalion. That's what it is. So it's okay. CB for short, but it's the CBs. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so yeah, they they build things, mm. and they also are very good at acquiring things. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. things just. <laughs> Show up at your at your base and my guys were awesome at acquiring things mm -hmm. and we didn't have a squat rack Which is which is crazy to me to be have no squat rack, right? Why why don't you have a squat rack? So yeah, that's yeah, ridiculous this this marine welded a squat rack now Here's the interesting part the squat rack. He was he was tall. He was like maybe six four or six five mm -hmm. Maybe not that tall, but Who's he was the marine, guy? The marine yeah. welder so on this squat rack <laughs> There was you know, there's adjustable yeah, things yeah. To, to, to put the bar on mm hmm well, this didn't have adjustable things. It just had two hooks and there was it's one hook at his height or one set of hooks at his height mm. and one set of hooks at my height. Mm -hmm. Everyone just had to figure it out from there. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah. yeah, but uh, but yeah, so yeah, you could bring you could bring that if you wanted to and so so yes We brought mats. I brought mats on that deployment and both actually both my deployments to Iraq brought mats and then what are the class like? Well, generally you're training with people that don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And I would have trained with them in the workup, you know, so they're starting to learn and they're like, you know, low level white belts or mid level white belts or even high level white belts. I don't think we, I even had one blue belt on either one of my deployments. And the good thing is they're team guys, they're athletic, they're strong, they're mm -hmm. in good shape, they want to learn, so they learn fast, they're tough, they're strong. Like I said, strong and athletic. So you're gonna get good roles. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the more you teach them, the better the roles get. Mm -hmm. Talking about gi or no gi, we never. Tra I never traveled with a gi for the military. I don't think. And so what? What I started wearing almost all the time was cami pants and a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And what's cool is I did that when as soon as I started jujitsu, I was training with other seals that were in cami pants and and a t-shirt because it didn't make sense to wear like a cami top. Yeah. yeah. And so what's cool is. Without even knowing it, when no one was training no gi, I was actually training no gi because mm -hmm. I did was just training with guys with t-shirts on. Now mm -hmm. they were wearing pants, but but anyway, so yeah, that's what we'd wear: cami pants and a t-shirt. Would we occasionally put on op gear? Occasionally, mm -hmm. but but not not very often. Uh, the other thing you got to watch out for with with my former organization in the SEAL teams is. There's guys that would go nuts mm -hmm. like they didn't want to tap because you get major egos and so guys could occasionally go psycho mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes when I when I pit per certain people against each other Sometimes I'd have to basically officiate slash be a safety officer to right. make sure that no one actually got killed <laughs> uh, Because they'd be trying to kill each other and no yeah. one wants to tap and you have to be like hey man You can't you know you're about to your arms about to get broken stop yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had to do some of that uh, And I'm I'm I am a bit of an instigator. Yeah, I know. When, when it, <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, you see it now. I still yeah. do it on the mats today. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if if there's two guys that are going hard against each other, but maybe they're not going super hard. Yeah, yeah, they could go hard. It's real hard. easy to escalate that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. And so, sure. and so, I would escalate matches between guys as well, and and then you know, I'd I'd just roll with everyone. So yeah, what would the class be like? We teach some moves just like a regular jiu-jitsu class mm. teach some moves go over some stuff and then roll yeah. and that's it Pretty simple yeah. good times. Yeah, I found that if you can do little drills with yourself If you go if you're a high-level guy and you're going with a white belt Especially if they're athletic what you do is you you know how like when you roll with a guy who's maybe one level give or take mm. from you you um or let's say they're one level lower. You'll kind of slowly put yourself into bad or, or worse situations. Right. You won't go all out or nothing like that. Yeah. But this is kind of counterintuitive. If you go with like a, a like a beginner, beginner, but they're athletic. What you do is you try to you think of a, a, a finish yeah, or you a make position. Do, do that. Yeah, as fast as you possibly can. Oh. So if you're like, okay, I'm gonna start on the bottom. So you're gonna force it. I'm on. gonna. No, no, no. Well, depends if you're on what you mean. Go as fast as you can. Force. You gotta have to force it. Yeah, but you have no, no, to no. force an arm lock. If you say I'm going to finish this with an arm lock, you're going to have to force him into that position somewhat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay. mean, you can set it up, sure. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's what. That's really the drill. Is you got to set it up. Given what he does, and he could be retreating the whole time. Sure, it's so it's going to take longer. It's just that's just how jujitsu is. But um, that's the drill in your head, rather than you know, let's say an intuitive method to roll with a white belt is let's just go light. Let's see what he does. Let him even get a good position on you, and then mm -hmm. I'll work out or whatever. But no, don't do that. Be like, okay, I'm going to treat this person like a person that I have to, in real life, subdue with, and you choose whatever yeah, way. that's a good game to play, actually. Yeah. That is a good game to play. And then you get real good at that. Like, 
going from one yeah. thing and then it's also I don't play that game very often I, I don't know what there's something that snaps in my head sometimes where I'm like okay I'm gonna just smash this person mm. but you know sometimes I'll be watching the clock and when there's 40 seconds left I'll be like all right I'm gonna try and submit this dude in the next 40 seconds or yeah. this is when I'm going against someone that's good you know mm. what I mean I, that's I, honestly I do that with you sometimes where yeah. you can feel me chilling and I'm all of a sudden I'm like oh wait there's yeah, only yeah. 30 seconds left and I have to go super hard yeah. to try and get you and sometimes I don't give myself enough time yeah. and so then I have to learn to get better <laughs> <laughs> yeah and yeah me saying that uh, agree like I don't do that in training because um, what I hardly. normally my lazy instinct is I always go just enough better than the person I'm going against to, yeah. to maintain and eventually finish them. See, and that's good because you give the other guy good training. Yeah, and and yeah. that's kind of the point yeah. with not, you don't want, if you go in regular jiu-jitsu class and you're a, like, you know, upper belt mean like purple, brown, black belt, and you go against a white belt, you get paired up with a white belt. I'm not saying necessarily to do that all the time because it's kind of, you kind of, it's a relationship you have with your training partners. So if I'm like, okay, every white belt I go against or any, or any beginner, I'm just going to go as hard yeah. as I can. It's like, bro, what are you doing no. to the guy? No, sure, good, cool. sharp. That, that's, why, that's why for what you're saying, for blue belts to do that is not good. For blue belts to do that, white belts, they don't have the skill yet yeah, to yeah, really yeah. do what that's you're doing. It should yes, be like purple belt, brown belt, black belt. Yeah. That's going to be that's gonna be like, okay, I'm going to test right. my efficiency on making this happen really quickly. Yeah. Blue belt against an athletic white belt is going to be is going to be World War Seven. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it, true. That's a, and there's injuries true. that are waiting to happen. Yeah, because a purple belt generally is not going to get it injured. Not going to generally yeah. injure someone from being in a bad position. Blue belt, white belt, maybe it could be yeah. Yeah, some bad scenarios. Yeah, and and so really the point in doing that is like in a scenario like your situation where you don't have anyone to train with except for beginners that are all athletic and hungry. So yes. it's like, okay, well, what do I do? You know, you know what's cool? That's a good way uh, I would better. come home from deployment better at jujitsu than when I left, for sure. Uh, yeah. That happened on every deployment. When I came home, I was better at jujitsu than when I left. But not only better than I was, but I was in keeping with the standards of the guys I was training with. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm rolling with Dean before I leave and I, I come back and I am now doing better than I was against Dean before I left, yeah, yeah. where he's been here training the whole time. Yeah. So that that says to me that is an effective way to train. You yeah. know, you just you just and that, so that's why there's really no excuse. A lot of people ask, you know, what should I do? I live four hours away from the closest gym. Man, get some friends, put some mats on the ground, watch YouTube, and start training with each other. Yeah. And occasionally, when you get the chance, go somewhere to a school once a month, once every two weeks, so you can learn. Yeah, it, yeah, and I think in your situation is is kind of a not u necessarily unique, but kind of a specific type of situation where you have all the fundamentals essentially True. down. True. So you know, like habitual stuff, stuff that you you just automatically do with certain techniques, which is the the correct technique. You mm -hmm. know, so you can. I think that you'll benefit more in that way where you can train with beginners but, and train uh, certain but, way. But and I'm get talking better. about when I was a blue belt myself. Yeah, I, I think, still got a lot better when I would be on deployment. Yeah, and when and I was a purple belt, when I was a brown belt. Yeah, still, still, it's just like a little, just a smaller um, version of that idea. Where if you're a beginner and you're like, okay, I've never taken jujitsu, I'm gonna start on YouTube or whatever. I don't think you can benefit from no. those situations. Oh no, you can definitely much. benefit from those. Not as much. You can't. Yeah, you, definitely not as much. Mm. But you can benefit. Yeah, you yeah. can definitely benefit. Oh, gotcha. You can definitely benefit. Yeah. It's better. It's a thousand times better than not doing anything and not training. Oh, yeah. And if you got one person that has that gift of being able to like understand what's happening, maybe yeah. you got a wrestler in there, bro, mm -hmm. that's going to help you so much. Or maybe yeah. you got someone that did judo, maybe that's going to help you so much. Yeah. But even if you don't, you just start looking at it and saying, okay, what's happening in this? What's happening right there? Okay, try that arm lock on me. And you get some of those good YouTube videos that really break things down well. Yeah. You can learn a lot. I, I think shit. you can because I didn't have to learn that way, luckily. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, you got to train with the best guys in the whole entire world. So you know, hey, you know, teach their own. Kinda and nice. I dig it. Actually, Spoiled. yeah. Um, actually, Hodger Gracie, who's you know, well, we not even arguably yeah. fucking, it, top yeah. three but all time. Yeah, ever. Yeah. He and he was actually telling me, he's like, I don't have like a team of world class guys to train with. He's like, yeah. sometimes I train with Braulio sometimes. Cause he's in yeah. England. He's in England. Yeah. So he has like, he's like, I only train with my students and who, who are good and they give awesome training, but they're not, I don't have world-class training right. partners. Like my opponents do kind of thing. Yeah. And the results speak yeah, for themselves man, kind I, of pretty I, amazing. Yeah. 
So man, to kind of teach their own, but all these things, yeah, can be beneficial even even if they don't necessarily seem like it. Yeah, and you know what I think actually this is leading to is like you get what you make out of it, right? Yeah, exactly. And there's there's people in the UFC that have done the same thing that came from some random camp Mm -hmm. and they're training hard and they go and win. Yeah, the the Conor McGregor. He didn't come from he didn't come from Greg, Greg Jackson. Jackson. Yeah, yeah, you know, he didn't true. come from American Top Team. Mm-hmm. He came from a gr- you know their school mm-hmm. with with Kavanaugh, and obviously they're doing something right. But same thing, he didn't have the the highest level guys to train against. Yeah. He trained. I'm not saying slagging off their their training partners, but it's not it wasn't a known camp when he came around. Right, right. He he's so he's a guy like that. Uh, Max Holloway, he's out in Hawaii, right? Mm-hmm. He's training hard. But he's coming out here winning the UFC championship yeah, yeah. based on you know his training partners. Yeah. So I think guys that that actually understand what they need to do, yeah. they do it. They get it done. Yeah. They don't make any excuses. Yep, at the they end don't even of the want day. any excuses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. But at the end of the day, that's it, right? Check. Next question. With life decisions, is it better to be decisive and take actions? To move forward, even if sometimes those decisions are wrong, as opposed to being paralyzed by indecision and fear, thus getting maneuvered on by life. I ask this because I struggle with life decisions and have trouble committing to one path due to eclectic interests. After listening to your podcast, I'm thinking it's better to be aggressive and maneuver on the battlefield of life as long as I'm prepared to adapt rather than sitting around and letting circumstance dictate my actions. Well, it sounds like he kind of answered his own question there, which is good. Yes, it is better to be aggressive. It's better to be decisive. This does not mean burning bridges, and I think we've talked about this before. It doesn't mean that you just you just say I'm quitting my job right now because I'm going to go start a new life as a whatever your new job is going to be. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start a business selling widgets, and I'm just going to go all in because I'm committed. Sure. Well, you you know how long does it take to produce those widgets, and where you know so there's a lot of issues with that. You know, it's there's a way though to to mitigate risk on your decisions. And actually, at the uh, at the camp we were in up in Maine, there was a lot of guys that were you know listening to the podcast, and one of them, really good, really good guy, uh, he was talking to me about his business. And the business, which I'm not going to go into any details, but he's basically saying, look, I got this business. It's going well. I want it to do better. And I'm kind of weighing this decision between bringing on, he says, no, I want to bring on like six people Mm. to really help expand and grow and all that stuff. He said, but if I do that and we have a couple rough, you know, if we hit some bad luck, I might be upside down and, and not be able to handle it. And, and what I really am scared of is like that's not, not just me, but it's now it's my family. I got a wife and I got kids, mm-hmm. and now I'm hedging the, the, the comfort and safety of my family. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what to do. And I said, okay, well, do you have to go all in, right? Do you have to turn around tomorrow and go, you know what? We're going all in. I'm going to hire these six people. We're going to expand, and hopefully if everything goes right, we'll do really well. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do that. You don't have to put that much on the table. Mm-hmm. Instead, I said, I said, well, how many people do you actually really need right now? Mm-hmm. And he said, probably one or two. And I was like, okay, why don't you bring on one? <laughs> yeah. and, and start to see where that goes and be prepared to look for another person to bring on two. And then as those two people work out and you're starting to fill their labor every day and they have work to do because you're expanding, cool, bring on three. And, and guess what, if you hit a hiccup, and things start going sideways for whatever reason, that's cool. You don't have those additional four people or three people on board that you're paying payroll to every month, which is normally what kills businesses Mm. or one of the common things that kills businesses. So it's the same, so so that's that's a good example, right? And he was, he thought to himself and he looked at me and said, absolutely, I'm gonna go do that. And so he's probably back at his job right now running his business and probably Hiring a person to start expanding, not hiring six people yeah. and putting all of his chips on the table. Yeah, 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 where it's a cool gamble. Let's say the percentage of winning winning is seventy percent. You're like, yeah, I'm just gonna do it. Right. There's a thirty percent chance you lose, lose, and now your now your family has no house and no food. Yeah. So that's not what we want to do. Yeah. So why not just put some of your chips on the table? Yeah, yeah. and you can still win and make a little bit. Mm-hmm. You still you still improve your position. 
So we got to do that with life too. Like I said, you don't quit your job to start building widgets when you don't know what you're doing. You got to. Why not just build the widgets in your spare time? Yeah. See what you know? Yeah. Start putting those things on the internet. Start seeing how they sell. Start getting a little income from them. Let them grow, and then finally, when you feel like the balance start to tip, maybe there'll be a last minute jump where you'll be like, okay, now I'm gonna go for it. Yeah. But what you're committing to is something solid, something tangible, and something that's making money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. We're not jumping in and committing to something that's an unknown. Yeah. We're going to commit some, to something that's known. And, and I think it's important to note that that right there is not a lack of commitment. And this is, you hear these like, you know, people on the interwebs. Mm-hmm. They'll be like, you know why you haven't made it yet? Because you haven't committed 100%. Yeah, yeah. That's why you, if you want to do it, you got to commit with everything you've got. Well, and so what people think is, okay, well, I'm just going to quit my job because I'm going to go for it. I'm going to commit and then I'll right. be successful because this guy over here told me if I committed, I'd be successful. That's actually not true. Mm. You can be a thousand percent committed to something and you can still fail. I got bad news for you. That's the reality. You know, that's the reality of, do you think the people at BlackBerry weren't committed (laughs) to their game? You know what I mean? You know, but what happened to BlackBerry? Mm. It's, it's, they they were committed, but they they made some bad decisions. And guess what? Now BlackBerry's not really in the game anymore. Well, Mm -hmm. I think they changed games. I'm not 100% sure. But people think that, that because you didn't quit your job, and put go all in and put all your chips on the table that you're not committed and I actually don't agree with that and I'll, and I'll get here's my example if uh, Okay, I think that commitment is actually harder to do when it's a long-term Commitment that you're going okay. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna stay at my job But I'm gonna work three hours a day on this other thing I'm gonna be manufacturing I'm gonna be making my widgets three hours a day when I get home at 10 o'clock at night I'm gonna go until 1 o'clock in the morning making my widgets. That's commitment Mm -hmm. It's actually smart commitment It actually in some ways takes more commitment to do that than it does just to quit your job and say I'm all in Mm -hmm. Because now you're holding you're balancing all these different things you're carrying you're shouldering more of a burden So that actually takes more commitment the problem is that people they they get weak, yeah. and after the fourth night of making widgets at ten o'clock at night, they go, "Yeah, I'm not, I'm yeah. good. It's cool. I have a job. I have a job. Yeah, yeah. And so that's weak. I, I, you know, an example would be, what if you could get in excellent physical condition in three hours, but it was just like the hardest three hours that you could imagine. Think about that. Mm-hmm. How, and, and your body would transform mm. from whatever crap condition you're in right now into a specimen. And it's going to take three hours of just hell. Yeah. How many more people would be in amazing condition? I don't know. I think a ton more. Mm. Because committing for three hours to something, even though it was going to be super bad, people would be able to do it. Mm-hmm. What takes more commitment? And the reason everyone's not walking around like a perfect specimen is because it doesn't take three hours. Yeah. It doesn't take three weeks. It doesn't take three months. It takes a daily grind that goes on for years that you have to hold the line on on the way you eat, on the way you exercise, on your life. Yep. And that takes real commitment. Yeah, that's true. So it isn't a lack of commitment. It's planning. It isn't a lack of commitment. It is mitigating risk. And... Don't confuse again. I, I think that the person that commits to something and still maintains this other income stream For example, that person is at least as committed if not more committed than the person says, you know what screw it I'm going all in over here. I'm forgetting about you know quitting my job and that's not a smart move Yeah, and it takes more that's actually an easier well, That's my point. It's easier in many ways to go, you know what? I'm quitting this day job. I'm quitting my nine to five. I'm sick of that cubicle. I'm sick of that construction site. I'm just going all in over here. That is an easier move. That takes less commitment Mm. than saying I'm gonna shoulder the burden of working 15, 18, 20 hours a day for the next two years until I can get this thing stood up enough to, to where I can execute it. Yeah. Yes, it's almost like people are conflating the commitment. You know, it's like they, they, Almost people want to want to want to sh- do a big show of commitment by quitting their yeah, job, but yeah. it's more of just a show of commitment. It's a show. It's either exactly. you're committed or you're not, kind of thing. Yeah. And then, so a lot of times with these big shows of commitment it comes just an immense amount of stupidity. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. When me- meanwhile you can either commit or don't commit. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Sure. If you don't quit your job and you make widgets, 
and you don't commit, sure, it's like, all right, you got, you can facilitate your non-commitment. Yeah, you know? yeah, I, I dig it. Your your real job, your nine to five job, is an enabler to you not committing. Yeah, fully. Yeah, but by no means is that you know no. proof. Yeah, yeah, and it's important to note that don't confuse. And this is another mistake. So people make mistakes on either ends of the spectrum. The other one is don't confuse planning and mitigating risk with not taking action because that can happen too. You have to make things happen every single day. That's what you have to do. If you don't take action, if you don't move, which is what this guy's asking about, then yeah, you're paralyzed and you're never going to get anywhere. But all you have to do is chip away at that thing. You yeah. gotta make a little bit of movement every day. Yeah. You wanna write a book, and this is something I'm familiar with now because I'm writing books, I'm writing another book right now. Hell yeah. And you know what I gotta do? I gotta chip away at that thing every day. Every day. Yeah. Every day. There's your commitment. A thousand words a day, yeah. 45 minutes, yeah. maybe an hour. That's what it takes. And guess what? If I can't get that hour, for whatever reason, guess what I'm gonna get? Two. T- 20 minutes. Oh. I'm gonna get 30 minutes. I'm gonna get something, to get in there, I'm gonna do work. Because I'm gonna be close to my goal than I was. Yeah, that's the way it is Yeah, man, and I think you got to see that live didn't you yes, (laughs) you know honor like it was my honor That's um, but that's where it happens Where else is it gonna happen right? Yeah, we were flying back from Maine I was uh, you know echoes cruising good. Yeah, I think I fell asleep a couple times Yeah, yeah, you were kind of in and out, but I was (laughs) I was hammering I was I was doing what I have to do Mm mm-hmm because if I don't do it then, when's that? When am I gonna get that hour? That was that was four hours I had right there. Yeah, flight. Technically five. Yeah, couldn't get my computer out for the first little bit. On oh the yeah, they didn't let you. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh good, bro. Yeah, I was kind of at times I was peeking over your shoulder, like reading. Oh, let's talk about writing over here. <laughs> and then I see uh, what was it? Uh, I saw the name Kenny Williamson in there. Oh no. So I was like, oh, I know what Jocko's writing right oh, now. Yeah. 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 Book two. That's good, man. Being composed. Yeah, I think that. All that sounds like kind of obvious, you know, when you're saying it. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 got it. Yeah. Or you know, or, or at least the part where it's like it's a daily thing. Like you gotta, you daily. gotta have a b- progress. You know, like you gotta take that step. You know, do it. Um, sounds obvious, but man, how many times? If I know this, like my friends and you know, whatever. Um, uh, you go on, I don't know, online or whatever, and you see people complaining about, you know. It, it, Stuff never happens for me, you know, FML, you know what FML means? Yes. Stuff never happens to you, that's right. And stuff never happens for you, that's right. Yeah. That is life. Yeah. Stuff yeah. doesn't happen for you in yeah. life. Yeah. You got to go and make it. You know, I've explained to my kids, you want to make money, you have to take that money from someone else. You have to take it from them. The, mm. the, people aren't just going to walk up and give you money. Yeah. Right? That doesn't happen. That's never happened to me in my life. No yeah. one has ever walked up and given me money. Yeah, me neither. You got to take that. They, they got to give it to you. They, you got to make them. You got to take it from them. Yeah. They want that money too. Mm-hmm. So what are you going to give them that's going to make allow you to take it from them? Yeah. That that. So yeah. Guess what? Nothing's nothing happens for you. That's right. Nothing does happen for you. You have to make it happen. Yeah. Huh. That's the default aggressive mindset. Mm-hmm. That you are going to make things happen. You're not going to sit around and wait for things to happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Oh, well, guess what? I read a story about this such and such a person and they just w- walked into this, you know, agency and they, they thought they looked, did a really good job and now they're famous. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> Base your life on that percentage chance of happening. Yeah. It's not happening. Yeah. I actually I actually look at that and just think the, my ch- the chances of anything like that happening to me are zero. Nothing good is going to happen to me like that that I'm just going to get a good deal like that. It's not happening. Zero. Yeah, yeah. So if, if, if you're going to get it, you're going to have to make it happen. Yeah. Next quest. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That should be the red flag right there then, right? Basically for the for someone who's like, not, you know, when am I going to get my big break or, <sighs> or, you know, nothing happens for me kind of thing. That should be the red flag, right? When it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as, as, soon, as, soon as you're, you're talking about the fact that you're not, that things aren't coming to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that should be a real big red flag. Nothing is going to come to you. Not happening. <laughs> not happening. <laughs> You got to go and make things happen. And once you have that attitude, I'll tell you what, it's a game changer. Yeah. It's a game changer. Once you realize that that book that's so good that's in your head is not going to write itself. Yeah. Once you realize that widget that you have this plan for isn't going to build itself. Yeah. 
then you'll realize like, okay, I'm gonna have to make these things happen. Yeah. And even then, guess what? You can make a widget that no one wants to buy, and you can write a book that no one wants to no, no one wants to read. And if you're not okay with that, which is another thing that happens, people say, well, you know, no, no one will like it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, if that's what you think, well, then don't even write it yeah. unless you want to write it for yourself. Yeah. Then write it for yourself. And cool, be be proud, be stoked, be happy. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. To, let's say a book, right, for example. It, this kind of reminds me of where, you know how, let's say, I don't know, me, I'm a, let's say, oh, I'm a, I'm a pretty good writer. In fact, I even wrote a book before, whatever. And then my friend on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, someone, my neighbor, whatever, they write a book and they they release it. And then they write another one. And may, let's say it's not even really that good, but it's out there. Mm-hmm. They're like, look at my new book. And, you know, they got people support. Oh, that's awesome. You wrote a book. And, I'll, and I'm, meanwhile, I'm like kind of sour grapes a little bit. I'm like, I'm, I'm a better writer than, than mm-hmm. that person. Meanwhile, I didn't write any more yeah, books. you didn't write a book. You know, I'm over here. Or you wrote one, yeah. Yeah, I wrote back in the day, long time ago, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm and I'm saying I'm in that arena, you know, right. and I'm kind of in my mind hating on this. Well, there's person. people, there's people that hate on them that never even wrote a book in the first place. Yeah, They're like, oh man, I'm a better writer. I'm a better film guy. Yeah. I'm a better fighter. carpenter. I'm a yeah. better fighter. Whatever. They yeah. all kinds of people doing that. Yeah. All kinds of people that that will just be saying, oh, you know, I I I was a better whatever fighter, yeah. jujitsu player, uh, carpenter. Uh, whatever you yeah. name it. Yeah. Meanwhile taking no Pro- action g- Software engineer. Sure. I could have done that. Why didn't you? Yeah, exactly right. I'll yeah, tell yeah. you why cuz you weren't committed yeah, that's part of And the yeah. commitment that I'm talking about is at night Yeah at night <laughs> That's potentially or early in, or the early in the morning or in the middle of the day, whatever yeah. you know it How you said like you're you're not doing these Enormous shows of commitment like either you're committed or you're not and if you're committed It's gonna show itself yeah, by exactly. your action, you know a lot of these people uh, again back to the, the guy who's like hating on His neighbor doing quote-unquote mediocre work like oh, that's John. That's not that good You hating know what on it. you know what it's, this just made me think of this sometimes you'd meet a guy that was say I'm going to seal training yeah. and and they'd kind of be brag about it mm-hmm. and you could see in their eyes that that right there was good enough for them. Oh, Just yeah, to be yeah. like, hey, I'm going to SEAL, t- SEAL Team Training. Yeah. You know, no one calls it SEAL Team Training, but <laughs> that's the kind of person because they just want to. Right, right. And you'd, I'd, I'd hear guy, you, you know, guys saying that, yeah, I'm going to SEAL Training. The guys that generally have a better chance are guys that, you know, you say, oh, what are you doing in the Navy? And they say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm you know, just got done with A school and I'm starting, uh, hoping to go to. SEAL training, you know, they, 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 you have to pry it out of them, yeah, right? Yeah. That guy's a better chance. The guy that's already bragging, yeah, yeah. basically indirectly bragging, mm-hmm. because he's implying that he's going to make it. Those guys going to have a little bit more of a rough time. Now, this doesn't mean they're not. This doesn't mean don't be confident. Yeah, but th- that's what what I'm saying is some people that are like, I'm going for it. They're happy with just saying I'm committed. I quit right. my job, and this is what I'm going to do. They're yeah. happy to, to let, let everyone know that. Yeah, but what they're not happy to do. Is grind. Yeah. That's what they're not happy to do, and yeah. that's where that's where you that's where you make your money, yeah. right? Or where you make your goods, or where you become successful. Yeah, there is. Oh, who was it? I was listening. To Doesn't matter. But I was listening to somebody, and they were talking about um, like commit. Like people have goals. I want to be a singer, or whatever. I want to be a CEO. That's mm-hmm. what I'm wondering. I want to be a CEO. But cool. You can form up an LLC today, and you can be get, become the CEO. Exactly right. So that's and kind of part right. of the, that's people. part of the point right there. It's like okay, you, you want to be a CEO because you see all this cool stuff on yeah. wh- wherever about being a CEO. But really, what you're pursuing isn't necessarily being this. It is, but what you're pursuing, where you're going to end up, and where you're going to find success as a CEO. If you're pursuing the day to day of yeah. being a CEO, it's yeah. like oh, I said this before, and it's it's. Uh, on the surface, it's lame, but it's it's actually really accurate. Like, if you want to be a gangster, you have to do gangster stuff yeah. every day. It's not just like posing with your guns. It's like you got to kind of, you got to put in that work kind of thing, <laughs> you know? So if you're going to be, like, you can't just be yeah. Jocko and start a podcast and just, and, and, you know, put out a book and that's it and start collecting money. It's not like that. <laughs> you got to, you got to go through. 
to you know however old you are there's that other, many there, years there's other steps involved yes exactly right the steps Leif, and that, Leif and I used to joke about uh, you know because when we started Echelon Front obviously it was just me and him and we'd see some other guy out there and he'd be like CEO of something yeah. and, and we'd be saying well that guy's the CEO of, and you look at their company and the company has them right. the only one person or three people right hey, bro you're that's yeah, kind of weird. Than yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like I'm the CEO. Hey, I'm the CEO of Jocko Podcast. Yeah, you know what I mean. No, yeah. it's just you and me. There's no yeah. CEO going on here. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're cruising too hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that um, yeah, that deal. You got to focus on the right things as opposed to the wrong things. Check. Next question, Jocko. I coach high school football. What should I do with the star athlete who segregates himself and won't participate in hard drills or won't participate hard in drills? Yeah. Now, this one, I actually thankfully remembered that I said I would do this uh-huh. because when I got this, this is a Twitter question. Uh-huh. And I responded to this Twitter question in one word. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he says, I got this guy, star athlete, he won't participate in drills. What should I do with him? I responded in one word bench. <laughs> I saw that. By the way. So, so of course, you know. Then people start saying, "Well, you know," it's a, and and I was like, "Yeah, I know. We're on Twitter, right? We're on mm-hmm. Twitter. Uh, there's more to it than what's happening." I just answered 798 questions, and this was 799. <laughs> so, um, not going to go into full detail. But then, as people were kind of chiming in, I was like, "Okay, I'll I'll answer this on the podcast, so we can go into it a little bit more." Because yes. You're a coach, you're a leader. And obviously, I talk about this all the time, Mm -hmm. leadership is a nuanced thing, it takes balance, it takes maneuvering, it takes chess playing, it takes mental jujitsu, it takes all those things, right? So the obvious answer of just like bench, that's my meathead answer, and fundamentally, we'll get to it, Mm -hmm. but and fundamentally, that may be the result, but let's dive into it a little bit. But who's the kid? Mm-hmm. What's his deal? What's his background? What's his attitude? Where's he coming from? What's his family like life? Or what's his family life like? What is, what's his past performance? What's his record? What year is he in school? I mean, there's all kinds of things we need to know, right? Yeah. So now once we've sort of figured out what he like, now that any one of those things, any one of those variables, is gonna is gonna change our course of action a little bit because being a leader doesn't mean you get to follow cookie cutter results or quick cookie cutter solutions to things, right? Mm-hmm. You're dealing with human beings and every single human being is different and every single human being has a little craziness to them that you cannot predict. Mm-hmm. So we're dealing with a kid. Guess what? A 16 year old boy, that kid is even more unpredictable and even more crazy than most, right? Because he's got testosterone flowing through his system. He's chasing girls. He's he's just going crazy. He's not secure with himself yet. He's got zits on his face. He's you know he's got yep. things going on. He's got issues. Yeah. And so this kid's crazy, and we're trying to deal with him now. Most kids can get you know they get through that, and they're still participating with the team. This kid's not. So one of the first things I always say this: you got somebody that's not stepping up in the leadership position, or they're not wanting to, you put them in charge of it. Mm. You know, you say, hey. Echo, I want you to run this drill. I think the way I'm watching you perform on the field, I think you could really lead this drill well. I want you to lead this drill and show these guys what's up. Right? Oh. <laughs> so, so you know what I mean? Like yeah, you got fully. a little fired up face on your look yeah. just there. Yeah. So that might take his attitude. And now instead of me saying, hey, Echo, you got to do this drill like everyone else. I already know that you don't want to do that. So I'm elevating you a little bit. Right. Giving your ego a little push, a little massage. And maybe you feel good about that now. And I say, hey, you know, you can run this drill faster than anyone else. I want you to lead it. I want you to show them how to do it. I want you to make our team better. Boom. All of a sudden, you're getting a little fired up. So that's that's one solution type, right? I'm just giving yeah. kind of a broad solution type. So another solution type is, is, and this is real easy, real easy, is when you're talking to someone that you want to improve their performance, you don't go to them and, and say, hey, uh, uh, <laughs> You need to get better because you're just right now you're letting the whole team down right. and you're just you, you think you're all good You think you're so good that you don't need to coach. You don't need to run drills with the team. You need to run drills with the team Now your attitude is what are you talking about? So instead of saying that I Again, I'm gonna ego you up a little bit and be say hey Man, I'm gonna talk to you. I gotta talk to you because I see 
so much potential with you with your game I see your athletic ability and I see the way that the other guys on the team look at you you might not sense it they look up to you you're a leader whether you want to be a leader or not and the potential that you have in as, as an athlete is not going to come to fruition unless you at least get some of your potential as a leader in line so the reason I want you to run these drills isn't to make you better I already know you're good I already know you're good at the drills the reason I want you to run these drills because I want you to be even better I want you to reach your potential and by the way you help and run these drills is gonna make the team better and the better the team does the better you're gonna do the more scouts we're gonna hear looking at you so there's that and obviously I'm gonna explain to him why the drills are important for him and for the team and for him and the team together for the all, everyone to reach their potential so those were those are good too and I guess overall broadly what I'd be doing this whole time is talking to the person talking to the individual trying to figure out what his reasons were for not wanting to participate in the drills and then countering those reasons with logical answers mm. and you know saying hey here's why it's important and explaining it to him and then eventually you're gonna to get to a point where my coaching my explaining my maneuvering my mental jujitsu none of it's worked and he's still telling me I'm not running the drills I don't need to cool bench <laughs> next question you know what I mean <laughs> well you played ball what do you think yeah because I, I think, didn't play football yeah no that's exactly right I would I, I would think and I'm trying to put myself in the mindset back when I was in high school um, I remember going into my senior year so you have uh, we had some kind of summer training so it was really like high school summer training two days no 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 that no. was that was for fall oh, okay um and that was like a camp situation but no summer training which was like after spring and stuff and and what they'd call it they call it technique sessions and all it was was like you know i played uh in high school it was kind of like a slap back which is a hybrid running back mm -hmm. wide receiver type and um so the technique sessions were just kind of passing drills and you know, just hand stuff and maybe even some footwork. But it's, it was kind of fun. It was just, you know, the quarterback was there and the receivers and the running backs. And you catch passes, run routes and stuff. And, you know, for like, I don't know, 45 minutes, hour. And um, so I remember going into my senior year and they're talking about, yeah, technique sessions this year, whatever, whatever. And I remember I was just talking to Jade, my brother. And I was like, yeah, technique sessions. Cause it's the kind where if you don't go, you don't get in big trouble or nothing. It's just strongly encouraged, you know, that kind of thing. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to those kind of because I was real. I, I had done. You were the man. I had done well as a junior and I uh, knew that now as a senior, I'm really going to do well or whatever, whatever. That's that was my little thought. Oh, I don't need to go to those. So I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm not going into those with this kind of tone that like mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. for people who are trying to trying to yeah. get better. Me, I'm already dope kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, and Jade goes. He goes, oh, yeah, like super sarcastic, like almost offended. He, he was like, oh, yeah, because you don't need that, huh? And, he was, and then he said, yeah, because you're just so much better than everyone else. Actually, yeah. I think he said both of those. Yeah. And I was he like, you right it, up. bro, it hit me really hard. I was like, dang, that he's right, man. <laughs> I was like, even if, even if, like, even if I really believe, which it, it's dumb to believe that I won't benefit from that training, even if. It's like I'm just like yeah I'm 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 better than you. My whole team, by the way, yeah. the team sport. We all work together to win this stuff. Oh, you guys, I'm better than all you guys. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's the feeling. It hit me real hard. I was like, I didn't miss any of them. <laughs> no, nah, man, I'm committed to this. So there was that. Um. So in that in that mindset, right, going in because that's probably what it is. Yeah, it might be just it, that. And it makes sense, like, where in your mind, if you don't get it brought to your attention, like, that's really what it is. I don't need to do these drills. I'm scoring touchdowns every single game. Mm -hmm. Why am I doing these drills that all these non-touchdown scoring people <laughs> are doing, you know? Yeah. Um, just put me in when it's time to score a touchdown. Kind of an attitude, you know? That's probably what it is. Or making tackles or whatever the position is. I don't know. Um, so, just like how you said make him kind of in charge of it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like this guy. Like, I don't know. Let's say his name is Jim. I don't know. Um, Jim, you know, take these guys and show them how it's done, kind of thing mm -hmm. in practice. Because practice is, is yeah. It, imagine, if like imagine that. if you said, "Hey, I'm not going to go to this thing." And the coach came up to you and said, "Hey, Echo, are you you know you missed two practices?" And you're like, "Yeah, you know." And he was like, "Hey, man, I need you to set the example and really show these guys how it's done." And you're not yeah. even showing up. Yeah. Uh, even and me, me back in those days, if 
if you would have left out the like you didn't show up part, leave that part out, that would have compelled me way more. Like if you're like, you man, you're you're over here as a junior killing it, and now it's about to be your senior year. You show you guys how it's done. I'd be like, hell yeah, will <laughs> you know? Because it's like feeding the, the yeah, ego yeah. kind of thing. And boom, I would oh yeah, big time take take charge in um pop Warner football, which is you yeah. know younger guys. In well, I played for the Kaloa Rams. Dang, yeah. they sound ruthless. They are. Still are, by the way. Um, and so my coach, his name is Coach Scoville, and he had this kind of, it's kind of like a policy, kind of the thing where when you do jumping jacks, when you do, um, you know, drills, like um, they call them grass drills. It's just like, oh, you do this stuff, you roll, you do these things. And while you do this in practice and even before the game when you're warming up, you yell as loud as you can. That's it. You yell. Little kids just yelling, getting that stuff for his reasons. And it worked, man. We're, we're good. And um, so what I would do is I would try to be the, like, yell as loud as I possibly can to be the loudest guy. During the entire whatever you're doing? You're just yelling the entire time? The drills. Yeah, when it's your turn. Not not if you're standing, you know, oh, you stand up in line. Got it. And then you the front go, three ah! guys go. Yeah. So the coach stands in front of three guys, three lines, and mm-hmm. the guys in the front are doing the drills. So. You, he, he holds the ball and you go, ah, and you just basically shuffle your feet and he goes like that. Then you turn, then you come back and he goes this way, turn, and then he goes down. Then you basically sprawl, mm-hmm. you know, boom, stand back up and ah, you know, and then he goes, okay, like that. And then the three guys run. Now it's the next guy's turn. Got it. You see what I'm saying? So, and when you're running, you got to yell too. So I, I that's when, actually good cardiovascular work. Yeah. To be yelling because you can't breathe yeah. as much. What it does is gets you in the habit of just going hard, hard. <laughs> Every play, yeah. you know, and when you're done, you don't have to yell. You're cruising, you're resting, getting ready. And when one is go time, is go time. And habitually, that's how it was, man. It was, it really worked. And um, so anyway, when I would yell, as I, and the coach would do this to a lot of kids, when you'd yell super loud, you know, how you could just see, hear that guy yelling above everybody. He would give that guy attention. He'd be like, look at this guy, he's getting nuts. Yeah, look at this, look at this guy. And now the next guy, he's going to try to out yell that guy and go harder, go harder. So it's that same idea. Mm-hmm. You know, you give that guy props for working hard or showing everybody how it's done kind of thing. And it's like, man, he's going to keep that shit up and everyone's going to want it. In fact, Jeff did me like that this week in training. So I go in and, and just like, okay, after training, it's like everybody, you know, uh, Jeffy Glover, Glover, yeah. He, um, you know, you do some push-ups or what? He'll mm-hmm. make you do some push-ups or whatever. And um, he's like, "Okay, do the triangle drill." You know, when you're you're on your back, you rock back. You do a triangle. Yep. You rock back again. Go other triangle side, the yeah. other side. So, you know, all levels are in there, beginners as well. And um, so I'm doing it, and he goes, "Oh, everybody in the middle of it, he goes, stop! Watch how Echo does it." And I'm like, "If I didn't see what was going on here, I would feel really empowered to ch- like show everyone how." And and you know, so he successfully pulled that off. As far as the feeling in my head. To a grown adult that knows because you doing. were you doing them? Yeah, I was doing it with everybody. And he paused the whole class and said, "Watch how he does it." You know, so it's and the so exact so you, same concept. You stepped up your game a little bit. Didn't yeah, you, you know, taking up my <laughs> technique, showing everybody. You know, yeah, no, it's good, man. That works. Then, like, I, and the point there is, even if you you know that that's what they're doing to you, it still kind of works. Yeah. So, hey, if you were the type of coach that had already had this happen before, and like you just benched guy. Mm-hmm. In the, and the coach had the reputation that you don't play around. This wouldn't have happened in the first place. Really, would it? I, I, I agree. Think. I think yeah. so. So you you may have to set the example at some point. Yeah. The only drawback of that potentially is um, you could, because in high school, a lot of the times, like you can have one or two guys on the team. Sometimes even one guy on the team that'll b- dictate the outcome of the game. Where if this guy's playing, yeah. you'll you'll, win. you'll probably win. If he's not, you'll probably yeah. lose. And you you have those dynamics in high school. Um, so if you run that risk where, I mean, unless you, if you're looking at a bigger picture, like, well, I guess this is a bad example. If the guy, if you, if you as a coach run things in a certain way yeah. where you ha- where you don't allow any slack, yeah, then the probability of this occurring is going to be less. Yeah. It can be done for yeah. sure. L- like, you know, it's, it's a funny story. Leif tells sometimes is we were doing desert training and long story short, there's an opportunity to have guys take a break and go to town and have some beer and get a good meal before the field training exercises start. Mm -hmm. And that's normal, what everyone does, but we didn't do that. We didn't take a break, didn't go get food, didn't go get beers, nothing. We just got after it more. (laughs) 
And I didn't really yeah. think much of it, but Leif was like, "Yeah, of course we wanted to go, but no one, no one wanted to ask you." Yeah, because yeah, it was yeah. just like, "Yeah, no slack. We're, yeah. we're not obviously we're not we're out here to train and get some. We're not yeah. here to, you know, go into town and drink a beer. No." Yeah. And it's kind of funny looking back, but I think that that you can establish yourself as a type of leader that's just not going to allow. Like, what are you talking about? You don't want to do the drills. Mm. Oh, but it starts with the little things. Like, yeah. who knows what this this kid. You know, maybe he didn't want to put on his practice jersey and he wanted to wear this. You know what I mean? Just like yeah. little things. Right. Little things build up and eventually he's seen it. Just like a normal kid. Just like a five-year-old that yeah. pushes the envelope yeah. with everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe I can't get away with that. Well, what yeah. can I get away with? <laughs> can't get away with that. What can I get away with? Mm-hmm. People like to push the envelope. Story of my life, man. Yeah. No slack. Right now. Yeah. But you can go too far with no slack. Of course. Yeah. And you now, now everyone hates you as a coach. Yeah. Because you just don't understand. You don't listen. And mm-hmm. you're a jerk. Yeah. You've you've gone too far in one direction or you've gone too far in the other direction. Balance, dichotomy of leadership. Get some. Yeah. That's true. Next question. Jocko, have you ever had a person you couldn't get through to? Someone that you couldn't manipulate? Then what? What do you do when you can't get through? Well, yeah, of course. Um, I've had people that I could not get through to. And generally speaking, these people are like level 12 arrogance. Mm. That's what they are, giant ego, that's what causes this. There was quite a few SEAL leaders that I dealt with. I shouldn't say quite a few, there were several SEAL leaders that I dealt with that were like that, and of several business leaders that I've dealt with that were like that. In podcast number five, I read that counseling letter, Mm. corrective measures, Mm. to a guy that was really arrogant and despite that letter he did not change and he got fired Mm -hmm. so what do you do when you got someone that you can't get through to you you fire them Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's if they're if and here's what you got to do is what what makes that tricky is that some people and this may this this will make people freak out there's some people that they're such good performers that even though they're slightly negative on maybe their team participation but they're so good that that it offsets their negativity right and that happens it happens you know what happens with sales people yeah. yeah. sales people are are in order to be in a sales position you got to be confident you got to be aggressive you got to be somewhat arrogant right you got to believe in yourself and so some sales people take that to the extreme where they're just like I don't need to listen to what you're telling me the new procedures are yeah screw that I'm the one that's doing the big dollars over here how about yeah. you follow my procedures boys <laughs> Right, so so that happens. <laughs> yep. Well, then what you got to do is you got to look. Does is this guy producing so well? Now that can create problems within the team, mm-hmm. and you have to balance those things. I, is this guy? Uh, is the negativity that he's creating offset by the awesome productivity that he's doing? Mm-hmm. And furthermore, if the guy's that good, hey, maybe we should be modeling some things after them. Mm-hmm. I got no problem with that. If you're the best performer, cool. I, w- I want to imitate you. I want to get my people to imitate you. So that happens. The other place where you might see it, a similar situation, is a leader that does really good with their relationships down the chain of command, for instance, but really has bad relations up the chain of command. Mm. So again, you got to ask yourself, okay, if I fire this leader, how many of these people that he has great relationships are now going to leave and what kind of detriment is that to the team? Mm. The, that can also happen with someone that's, doesn't that treats their people like crap, but up the chain of command, everyone thinks he's great. And and he's getting the mission done, by the way, mm-hmm. right? He's a slave driver, and he's creating total animosity between him and his team, but he's accomplishing the mission. Mm-hmm. So now what do you do? There's a risk, everyone could quit. There's risk, you could fire him, and now you don't accomplish the mission anymore. This is why leadership is hard, and this is why you have to balance everything. Mm-hmm. You have to balance those things. But talked about it a bunch of times. If you get someone, you coach them, you mentor them, you do everything you can, you flank them, you do jujitsu, mental jujitsu on them, you try and get them squared away, and eventually, if you can't, you weigh against you know how it's going to affect the situation, and then in many cases, you got to let them go. And we fired, you know, we fired, five, saw plenty of seals get fired from mm-hmm. leadership positions, um, and. And same thing with, you know, obviously we work with consulting businesses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we see all kinds of people getting fired because they're either not capable of doing their job, they're too arrogant, 
and they don't recognize that things are going sideways and they're just thinking that they're doing everything perfect. No, that's not going to work out well for you. Mm. Yeah, what did, um, I think it was Leif. He said, uh, someone asked him, uh, you know, when do you know? When's that line where it's like when it's time to fire someone? Yep. And he was like, in a nutshell, there's a lot to it, but in a nutshell, which I thought was dope. Um, he said, it's, you know you're at that point where you, where you fire someone when um, when you don't feel bad about it. Right, right. So it's like, yeah, you, you tried you've, you've everything. tried you, everything. And, and there's also people, which there's some validity to this, that say the first time you think you should fire someone, you should fire them. Th- that's okay. the other end of the spectrum, right? Mm. And what that means is when you're looking at someone and you're going, man, okay, I can save them, I can help them. That's the kind of advice you give to someone that's that's a that's got a maternal instinct uh-huh. right that you meet someone hey I know this guy's just a good guy and everyone on my team is great and everyone's gonna do a great job mm. you can't tell that person what Leif and I normally tell people which is when you feel good about it right. you should fire him yeah. because that person will never feel good about firing anybody just about oh, okay you see what I'm saying because yes, he just I oh, this know. guy I know he's gonna make it I know he's gonna come around right. you know I and then they then they start playing the the extreme ownership game yeah, which yeah. is you know if I would have given Echo a better direction, he would have been able to do this. It's right. my fault. Yeah. Uh, I've given Echo seventeen re- iterations of this, and he still didn't complete it correctly. He's fired. That's the way it works, right? There's, yeah, yeah. there's so, a balance. So that spectrum of of you know being within the confines of being justified firing somebody, a certain type of person, you got to say when you don't feel bad about it. Right. Um, right. I mean, that's like a fire heavy type dude right but there's also someone th- the reason you shouldn't feel bad about it is because I've done yeah. everything I can do to yeah. help you yeah. which takes work it takes effort it mm-hmm. takes tact it takes hard conversations because it's hard for me to go and say echo you know I've been I've been looking at your videos lately and they're they're not really what we're looking for right mm-hmm. I don't want to say that to you it, mm-hmm. you know it's uncomfortable yeah, and we're kind hard. of like you know we we, we want to get along so instead I'm like yeah echo that, that video was good man yeah it's good mm-hmm. but I'm not telling you the truth mm-hmm. and then over time our videos aren't looking good enough and eventually I say you know what you know we're not, no one's buying our videos anymore and we haven't gotten any new contracts so guess what yeah. I'm gonna have to let you go and you're like what are what you talking hell? about <laughs> what are you talking about you said all the videos I made were good now yeah, you're firing yeah. me maybe you need to be become a better salesperson yeah, right yeah, yeah. <laughs> whereas if I had the hard conversation early and said hey echo you know I know you're creative and I appreciate that but we also need to get the message across for our clients I'm obviously fabricating a business where we're making videos, videos for clients, for clients yeah. Yeah, yeah which I know we don't really do a lot of anymore occasionally you do it. <laughs> oh, I but you. uh but yeah you got to you got to um to have the hard conversations earlier if I'm the type of person that doesn't like to have the hard conversations once again I never feel good about it because I never I yeah. never gave you any advice so it always feels bad for me to fire someone yeah but if you're following good leadership tactics then absolutely true when you get to a point where you got to fire somebody you won't feel bad about it because you know yeah. you've done everything you can you know you've coached them mentored them and you know that if you keep them on board you are negatively impacting your team yeah. which is bad yeah and then go down to the other side of the spectrum still within the confines of being justified in firing somebody by the way but on the other side of the spectrum you get how you say the what do you call the maternal instinct type maternal person instinct. the person who can like they're, they're, they're just super hard on themselves maybe or they're you know like I, I even if you did do everything you can you're still like I could have done more yeah, you yeah, know yeah. so it's my fault not his I feel thing. like I let them down as a leader yeah you, you gave know. them 17 counseling chits yeah you know they don't belong here yeah. they can't do their job stop yeah I mean well they're going home laughing at you or whatever yeah but yeah you get that kind of personality so it's kind of like how you say you got to balance it you got to be like okay you got to recognize okay what kind of person am I you know or what kind of person is this other person kind of thing and if they're those maternal instinctual for lack of a better way of putting yeah. it um, person then what was it the first time you feel like you should fire them you should fire them right. you you hang out on that yeah. side of the spectrum yeah, you, you got to yep. yeah yep. next Check. question how do you regain respect from your employees after you've come across as too nice My husband and I are business owners with 45 employees in a small software firm. Since adding more employees in the last 18 months, the culture is changing. I blame our easygoing attitude increasingly. 
there is an attitude problem where negative pushback has become almost a daily occurrence. How do we lead our way out of this? Okay, well, this is a rough one. Um, not, not by no means, I shouldn't have even said it's a rough one. It's, it's a challenge, right? You have to hit the reset button for sure. And you got to let people know that things are changing. Now, I would straight up have a meeting that you, you, you sit everyone down and say, hey, here's what's happening. Mm. We are growing. And as we grow, we are going to have to evolve just like a person. As you get older, you have to evolve. You have to become more mature. And here's some of the things that we're going to have to tighten up, right? Is instead of, you know, everyone's just, hey, if you come in and you want to go, you got to, you know, it's your kid's birthday. Oh, yeah, no problem. Day off. You say, look, that's not happening anymore. We will do our best to let you out for your daughter's birthday. We will do our best to let you go take care of family members when they're sick. We will do our best to give you bonuses that you've become accustomed to. We will do our best to give you raises annually. We will do our best to continue to take care of you, but none of those things are guaranteed at all. We are trying to be profitable. In fact, we have to be profitable in order to continue as a business. On top of being profitable, in order to grow, we have to reinvest in the company. We have to take the money that we make and we have to put it back into this company in order to grow. And we are going to grow, that is our goal. And in order to grow, we are going to have to put procedures and standards in place now that will allow us to maintain some control and efficiency as we grow. If we don't do that, we're gonna fall apart. So that is what we need to do. Now, why do we wanna grow? The reason we wanna grow is because we wanna be bigger. We wanna create more opportunity for everyone sitting in this room. We're not trying to grow for us, we're trying to grow for everyone. The more opportunity everyone has to advance in leadership, to make more money, that is what we are trying to do. But we can only do that if we, as we grow, we evolve and become better and become more efficient and become more standardized in the next 18 to 24 months. That is what we have to do as a company. So I would have a meeting and say something like that, something along those lines. Lay down the law a little bit. Now, also then, you have to change your attitude. You have to somewhat change your attitude. Because you are Mr. Nice Guy. That's how you ended up in this position. You, you know, the husband and wife team, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Nice Guy. Mm -hmm. And you can and should be nice as a leader. I understand that. But at this point, the, the team needs to get tightened up. And so you're going to have to impose some discipline on them in order for there to be freedom in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, sure. right? But we know that. Now, I had a friend who was a platoon commander. And he was he worked with me and I knew him. And when he was a platoon commander, he was a real nice guy. Super nice guy. When he was a platoon commander, he was a nice guy. Super nice guy. Things didn't work out good for him. Hmm. Because I don't know that I don't, I don't specifically know what happened, but I know that things didn't go great. And when he talked to me about it, because the thing is, when I worked with him, we were all bros, and I was a young enlisted guy. But he, we know we were all bros, but we all had that level of respect. Hey, you know what? We can go out and have a beer tonight, but tomorrow morning when we get to work, I'm, I'm in the game, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm towing the line. And that's pretty much what we were all like, mm -hmm. all of us enlisted guys working with this guy. And when he got to this new place, new command, all of a sudden it wasn't like that anymore. And he was broing out with people, and when he get back into work, they, they wanted to bro out at work. And it was like, well, we don't need to listen to you. We were having beers with you last night. Yeah. And that's what he told me. He said, you know, I, I was too nice of a guy, and I didn't get the respect that I needed to be able to effectively run the platoon. Mm. And it was not good. And he said something to me too, which I, I guess I instinctively knew, or maybe I didn't, but it stuck with me. You know, it's real easy to give more slack to someone 
when you have them on a tight leash, mm-hmm. right? It's right. real easy. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to do the other thing. Yeah. It's hard to, well, listen to this. When I have you on a tight leash and I give you a little bit of slack, you're happy. You're yeah. like, oh, look at Chaco. He, he trusts me. He's letting me go a little bit. Yeah, yeah. When I give you all kinds of, got all kinds of slack and all of a sudden I have to tighten it up I start pulling on the leash well guess what it chokes your neck yeah, yeah. it chokes you I don't like and I start bringing and the, and the further I got to pull you back on in the longer you're choking for yeah. and so by the time you get back to me you're ready to bite <laughs> yeah and so that's what you have to do you don't walk in and let, put the dogs out and let them run wild on, to the end of the leash and let them run wherever they want yeah. and then try and pull them back in because yeah. when you let them go by the way you're thinking to yourself well you know this is a good dog so when I let him run around, he's not going to do anything wrong. He's yeah. going to be a perfect saint. When there's a chance that that's going to happen, and there's a chance that that's a good dog, and you let him run around, and when you say come back, he comes back to you. There's also a chance that he's not a good dog. And when he gets out there, he starts running and start biting people mm-hmm. or running in the road or mm-hmm. doing whatever bad dogs do. <laughs> and so sure. what, what are you going to have to do with that dog is you got to pull him back to you. And it's, it's actually worse because we already know this is a bad dog. So now when you pull him back, he's pissed, yep. and he's going to bite you. Whereas a good dog wasn't doing anything bad in the first place, and when you pull him back in, he looks at you and goes, hey, I must have gone too out of control. I, I'm sorry. I'm back in line now. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? There's a, the, yeah. the, the way the whole thing unfolds is bad because the bad dog, he's a bad dog, and he's doing bad stuff when you give him slack on the leash, and when you pull him back, he's going to snap at you. Mm-hmm. The good dog, you give him all kinds of room on the leash, he's not doing anything good, and when you pull him back, he goes, he goes, oh, sorry. I, I didn't realize I was doing something out of line, mm-hmm. master. Sure, I'll, I'll keep it in check now, and you can give me more slack if you want, or not. Doesn't matter. Mm. I want to. I want you to trust me. Meanwhile, the bad dog, he's just like growling. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. pissed. Salty. So that's going to be a hard one. Um, not, like I said, it's not impossible. But the big thing you got to do, I think, in this situation, you got to be clear. Here's what's going on. You could even potentially. I don't know how well you are of a speaker interacting with people you could even say something along the lines of you know hey look we've been running this real loose and I've been real you know we've been doing everything we could to to run this as loose as possible but we got to tighten it up I think that's I think you could say that because you don't want to say look I've been being nice and I can't be nice anymore Mm. that 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 comes across wrong yeah but to say look we've been running it real loose here and we've been trying to give you guys as much freedom as we can and we still want you guys to have freedom, but we got to put some parameters in place that are gonna that are gonna allow us to run this business efficiently as we grow and as we scale. Yeah, you can quote me on that one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, m- makes sense when you say um, be clear and consistent. You know, like how um, you know some people they'll implement rules, and I'm speaking from an employee standpoint mm-hmm. where I'm looking at the boss when they're trying to put in new mm-hmm. rules to tighten it up, so to speak. Because right. in the nightclub industry, that tends to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, managers broing out. With, I like the term "bro out," by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you never heard good. that? Have you never heard that before? I, I don't think so. Not that I oh. can remember. But oh, that's I, interesting. But I, like I thought that was pretty common vernacular, no. especially amongst a bro like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> bro out yeah broing out with them um yeah and the nightclub managers tend to bro out with people or you know bro out with girls or whatever the waitresses whatever whatever i don't know if you can bro out with girls <laughs> yeah i know that's why <laughs> you kind of caught yourself there, it. didn't you There's probably a different word for it Check. Word, group of words whatever um but nonetheless that tends to happen so, so you know sometimes same same situation you know you get Nightclub is in dis- disarray mm-hmm. as a business, you mm-hmm. know. Then they got to tighten it yeah, up and apply more up. rules. And now you got to, you know, whatever with the clock ins. It's like just little rules. That, yeah. And Look at I, you, negative attitude. No, all these rules. All these damn rules. Yeah. Bro, I'm a late person. So the whole <laughs> clock in yeah. thing. Is, anyway, long story. But, um, it's kind of an so, anti echo scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. When the manager would implement the rules, but they don't follow the rules, you know, oh, yeah. it's man, it they just won't take, and no. people get more mad. But when you see there was this man, and he died too, unfortunately. Joel, he was, um, he was, he was our boss for for a while, and he uh, he had to kind of do that, like implement new rules. Mm. But this was a guy he would bro out with you, but like it was weird. He did this <laughs> weird kind of balance where he would break some rules but then he'd follow Mm -hmm. rules but the rules that he broke he wouldn't care if you broke them kind of thing these are all small teeny tiny rules by the way um 
but he was a real consistent person, you know, where yep. if he wanted something done, we were all doing it, including him, you right. know. And I remember thinking, man, this I really like this guy in that way as well, where he's telling us to do stuff, but he won't like, because there's other managers, oh, man, I could go into it, man, where there's other managers and they were straight up like, I'm the manager here at this nightclub <laughs> and everyone worships me. And it's a weird dynamic in nightclubs. Anyway, and they oh. wouldn't follow the rules at all, you know, but yeah. you had to because you're the employee. You know, yeah. kind of thing. But yeah, when you're a manager, and again, from employee standpoint, and and I see my boss following the new rules s- consistently. Yeah, it's so much easier to sign on. It's kind of like, okay, that's what we're doing. I dig it. And yeah, if you combine it with like what you said, being clear. Oh, I'm down. I'm down for the change. I get it, man. Yeah. I get it. Um, yeah. Next question, Jocko. No bad teams, only bad leaders, and always the same relationship with each boss. Yet, you also staged a mutiny. How do you reconcile that? Okay, so what he's talking about, obviously, no bad teams, no bad leaders, is from extreme extreme ownership. ownership. And it's actually from before that. Napoleon said the same thing. Hackworth said the same thing. Mm. We we changed the words a little bit, but... uh, so that's and then the other thing he's talking about is that I always say I have the same relationship with every boss I've ever had whether they were stupid or smart or whether they were aggressive or passive whether they were big ego or humble I always had the same relationship with all of them that is they trusted me and they gave me what I need to do to do my job so how do I reconcile but then then he's talking about staged a mutiny because we had a kind of a mutiny in one of my platoons back in the day uh, when I was a young enlisted guy and so how can you do that right if I had all these great relationships with all my bosses and but what but I staged a mutiny interesting I actually had a decent relationship with a guy that I staged a mutiny with now that I think about it <laughs> so bro. to go back to the earlier question we well, talking about being a renegade and you know being a, a rebel and and like I said you you have to rebel when it is necessary so and also for the mutiny that is in question I I need to make it clear here. I didn't stage the mutiny. It wasn't me. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a group effort that was somewhat led by the leadership of our the enlisted leadership of our platoon. And it was a movement that I certainly supported Mm -hmm. and was on board with. And we were kind of the E five mafia in that platoon. Sure. Yeah. So we were kind of had the voice of the people, (laughs) right? (laughs) Me and a certain group of guys, actually from my buds class, (laughs) who were were all kind of yeah kind of just fired up about things (laughs) and uh, you know I it wasn't like the thing is it wasn't like the platoon commander had a couple of weaknesses right and maybe he wasn't the best at tactics or maybe it wasn't that you know he wasn't the best shot or anything like wasn't the best athlete no he was a good athlete he uh, tactically he was like marginal Um, but what he didn't have talk about this all the time what he didn't have is he didn't have any humility at all Mm. and so he wasn't listening to anyone that was giving him any input including he had very experienced senior enlisted advisors so the platoon chief and the platoon LPO were awesome guys very respected seals one of them had been in the first Gulf War on the ground getting after it as much as he could so these guys were experienced and the senior chief was a really really smart guy and this guy wasn't listening to him. And so you had somebody that in the situation was it would have been bad for the platoon to have this type of leader in there. And now think about this. If it's bad for the platoon, then it's bad for your mission. Mm. If you don't have a good platoon, you can't execute your mission well. And that's the bottom line to this question. That is how I reconcile this. How does this situation affect the mission, affect our ability to accomplish the mission? How does it do it? If we have a bad leader and it makes us a bad platoon, then we're not gonna be able to accomplish our mission. And therefore, I need to help get rid of this person because my number one thing that I'm trying to do is be good at my mission. Mm -hmm. And, Obviously, a more unified team is going to accomplish the mission more effectively and more efficiently, period. So that, that, you know, that is why it is so important for people to understand the mission and the goal and the commander's intent because all of your decisions 
are based on and guided by that understanding of understanding what the mission is. Mm-hmm. And so you need to put the mission first all the time to make the right decision. Now, as soon as I say that, what pops in your head? Oh, Jocko, you care about the mission more than you care about your men. Not true. Because think about this. If you are executing your mission effectively, you are taking care of your men. That's in the business world and it's in the battlefield. Because in the business world, if I'm executing my my mission effectively, guess what we're doing? We're making more money, we're being more profitable, we're gaining more clients, we're growing. And therefore, I'm taking care of my employees because I'm keeping them employed and making them more bonuses and making them more money and offering them more leadership opportunities. In combat, same thing. If we are good and I execute my mission effectively, guess what? We've mitigated risk the, 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 in the best possible way. The more we mitigate risk, the more people are alive, the less casualties we take. Mm. So if I'm doing everything geared towards the mission, then, then I am taking care of my men. Because by the way, if I'm running a mission with heavy casualties, what about my next mission? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you're my boss and you tell me to charge this machine gun nest with my guys, and I say, boss, you know, we, we shouldn't do that right now. You, you, you carry out the mission. Okay, well, who's going to do the next mission? Right? There's not mm-hmm. unlimited guys here. So you can't do it. You can't run a mission after you've taken he- heavy casualties. Just like you can't, if you, as a business person, if you expend all of your capital on one project, well, guess what? You can't do the next project. So good job. You accomplished the one mission, but you can't accomplish any more. Mm-hmm. On the battlefield, if you incur a bunch of casualties for one mission, you can't accomplish any more. So in both those cases, the more effectively you, you handle the mission, not just the one mission, but your broad mission, your strategic mission, the better you do that, the better you are taking care of your men. And the better you're taking care of your people in the business world. So, and on top of that, on top of that, of the time, your mission is aligned with the best thing for your people. That's what I'm saying. Mm. 99% of the time. If we make more money as a company, it helps all my people. If we we accomplish missions in the most effective and efficient and take the least casualties, that's the best thing for my people. Mm. So back to the question, how do I reconcile these things? I look at how I can best accomplish the mission and if it best accomplish the mission to rebel against what's happening there's some cases where I might not you might be my boss Mm -hmm. and I might not like you Mm -hmm. but you've got a great relationship with the army commander and we're working in their battle space Mm -hmm. would it make sense for me to to throw a mutiny and get you fired no it'd make no sense whatsoever it's gonna be better for our mission if I say echo sucks but I'm gonna listen to him and we're gonna massage this thing and we're gonna make things work because he has such a good relationship with this army commander that he's making things happen. Mm. So I might not do it. I might not stage a mi- uh, mutiny, not based on the fact that you, that your level of sucking, but based on the fact that what's more important to me is that we accomplish our mission. Mm. And if you have a good relationship with the army commander, I'm gonna keep you around. Mm. If you were, if you were, in a business situation and you had you were not doing a good job and you're one of my subordinates you're not doing a good job but you have this great relationships with all these clients and we're accomplishing our mission well because you've built these great relationships mm-hmm. am I just gonna fire you because I think you're doing it I think you're a crappy leader of your men no actually I'm not what is best for the mission mm-hmm. now I might have Ter- secondary and tertiary plans to move you into position where you don't have to handle the operational things that you suck at and I might put you in a position where you're just going to become you know a business dev a biz dev guy where you're out there meeting and greeting people because that's what you're good at mm-hmm. I might make that happen but I'm not just going to go Echo's a bad leader fire him throw away the the skill that you do have mm. and now we're not accomplishing our mission because I ruined all the relationships because now you go to all these all these uh, other partners that we have and you're going to yeah Jocko fired me he's <laughs> pathetic he doesn't realize what we're doing here I'm going over to this company come with me yeah, bring yeah. your business over here with me yeah. so you reconcile it by looking at the mission and the mission is almost always aligned with taking care of your people 
mm-hmm. and taking care of your people in the sense of imposing discipline or not imposing discipline it is being disciplined and making them work and giving them training them hard mm-hmm. pushing them that is generally what taking care of your people is yeah, taking care of your people isn't hey you know what echo oh uh, you know uh, don't worry about that video that you owe to the client. I know you. I know it's your daughter's birthday. You go ahead and go home for the day. Am I taking care of you? If I do that, no, sir. Am I taking care of you? No, no. I'm not. I'm actually hurting you because now we got a bad reputation. We delivered the video late. The company passes word to the next company. It says, "Hey, you know those guys are their, their video is okay, but it doesn't matter because it was late." Mm-hmm. Now that's the reputation we have. Now, fast forward six months, we're downsizing. I don't need you anymore. I'm going to make the, um, you know, I don't need four video makers. I only need one, and you're not the one. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm not taking care of my people. Yeah. If I focus on the mission, which is, hey, Echo, I apologize. I know it's your daughter's birthday, but guess what? We owe this video. We got to get it done. Mm-hmm. And you got to get in here and make it happen. Am I taking care of you then? Yes, I am. I know it doesn't feel that way, mm-hmm. but yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I did. Making sure they're equipped, capable, and treated fairly. Yeah. Yeah. I said impose discipline on them. Yeah. And, like, that doesn't work. Yeah. But what you have to do is you have to impose discipline yeah, on Yeah, make sure There's the, the discipline dichotomy. is in place. There's the dichotomy. We'll say, yeah. Because you don't want to say, Echo, you will come in and make this video. Right. I'm imposing this on you. I'd be like, Echo, we owe this video. We said we're going to turn it in. Let me tell you the ramifications if we don't do this. Yeah. Here's what's going to hurt. It's going to hurt this, 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 and this. It's going to eventually could end up with you not having a job and me not having a business. Yeah. Do you like the sounds of that? No, you don't. No. You might be the wrong guy to ask about this. Maybe you're not. I don't know. But. What do you think? So you mentioned missing your da- my daughter's birthday. Mm-hmm. Right? I didn't miss my daughter's birthday, by the way. Um, did you say you did or did not? Did not. But okay. my son just had a first birthday. Mm-hmm. I did miss that. Right. But it's his first birthday. So I've always thought, this is before I had any kids with any birthdays, that the first birthday, that's for the parents. It's not for the kids. You know, he mm-hmm. doesn't remember the first yep. his first birthday. He never yep. will. I'm definitely going to be the wrong person. <laughs> so keep going. <laughs> So, so missing birthdays, is that like a bell curve? Like, okay, one, first birthday, age one, you can sort of miss that. Age zero, you can't really miss that. Yeah. Meaning when go, they're born. Go, you know? go go talk to the military people in the military. I know, bro. Yeah. I know, I know, yeah. No, you're right. And I'm saying if you have the options, and, you know, we're speaking in terms of Okay, if your you have the options, sure, the, go to the No, no, well, I, I mean, you sort of have, like, in terms of, you know, we're at this company, you're my boss, I'm the video maker. Hey, Echo, you know, mm. we got to get this video done, whatever. I don't know. That may be even in an extreme case, but I'm just saying in a general sense. Mm-hmm. Which birthdays are more expendable? That's ultimately the question. And it doesn't necessarily mean in this yeah. specific I'm going to tell you right now, as a guy that was in the military for 20 years, the birthday, if you're there, it's a luxury. If you're there for Christmas, it's a luxury. If yeah. you're there for Thanksgiving, it's a luxury. I missed all kinds of that stuff all over the place. Just like a big joke. You big, you know, you're just not going to be there. Okay. So yeah. now mm-hmm. we're not in the military. Uh huh. No, <laughs> just saying. and it's less about missing them or Still not missing luxury. them. Okay, so at the end of the day, no matter what birthday, even right now, you're thinking if you miss them, no huge deal. No, I mean, and if I actually thought it was a huge de- deal, I would have to choose an entirely different lifestyle and life. Right. Right. And I'll tell you what, my kids know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And they've always known. Well, okay, okay. So guess now- what? <laughs> Someone's out there getting after. He's named. He's named my dad. Yeah. No. 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 Okay. okay he okay. missed another birthday. Okay. Don't care. I get you. Yeah. No. You're. I dig it. And but that's kind of in a way. I mean, not to be too specific in split hairs, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I mean, not y- even necessarily you okay. in your sp- specific situation. You're saying I'm which saying are the most important birthdays? Exactly right on the spectrum okay. of Ready? valued Stand birthdays. By. Five through eleven. Five through eleven are have the most weight. Most weight. Okay. So. Not zero, not zero. when they're born. No. Nope. So One, if you nope. if you miss the birth of your child because you had to work, and I'm not saying military, I'm saying yeah. because you were trying to finish some report or something yeah. or whatever. 
or some yeah, proposal. don't do that. Yeah. You try and be there. So, okay, so but comparatively one. speaking, the the birth of your child compared to the fifth birthday, you say fifth birthday is more important. Yeah, because they don't remember anything from zero to four. Right. That's just a big. Dang, that's a good point. And <laughs> that's. <laughs> Is this a big buzz, like nothing that, happening? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't like know. Like all those, it sounds like all that, those but. parents that you take your kids, and I did this too. I actually, I didn't. I did it with my first kids. My wife was like, "We're gonna go to take the girls to Disneyland." Yeah, and I'd say, "Oh, okay." Walk around at Disneyland, which is pretty close to a living hell to yeah, me. Actually, agree. Standing in lines in the Anaheim summertime, like just baking, <laughs> and and yet, you know, here's the deal: baking. the girls are just. So excited the whole time and so yeah. happy. Yeah. Me, no. You're so not. now I, I, I don't. I haven't been to any of those things in a long time. Um, actually, I went with a, a business group and walked around. And Where Disneyland? Disney World. Dang. And I was like, "You've got to be kidding Disney me! Kill World. me now!" <laughs> but this is the thing: the kids don't remember it. You can show them pictures and they go, oh, that's cool. You could stage those pictures like oh, a moon like, landing. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> Just set them up and be like, oh, yeah, so, there's so like, Cinderella, whatever. You're we saying can... before five. Before yeah. five years yeah. old. Okay. Actually, man, that's a good point because when I say. Now, I'm sure there's developmental things happening when they're when you do things, when you participate in activities with your kids, yeah, obviously. Yeah, well, yeah but between they're not. Between zero narrowed, and five. Yeah. But, you know, you, you could probably, it'd probably be more developmentally helpful for you to spend a day with them you know, coaching them in, in yeah. jiu-jitsu or coaching yeah. them in boxing or coaching them in Muay Thai or coaching yeah. them in shooting or coaching them in archery yeah. or coaching them in hunting small animals or coaching them in how to do combat trauma care. <laughs> I mean, just like general things. Yeah, four-year-old. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, As that's opposed not to like, even part hey, of the, go to Disneyland, look at... You yeah, know, that's not the, 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 the question. People. is like the birthday thing. So, so, so yeah. you, only because you mentioned... Because by 11, birthdays. they don't care anymore. By eleven, they don't care. Oh, okay, They're so like, that's, oh, it's my that's birthday. Why the cutoff well, is, my kids, we're, yeah, we're all like, "Oh, my birthday, don't care." Yeah, so man, that's a oh, good thanks. point. We we have a rule: you get to pick to where you go out for dinner on your birthday night. Yeah. But in, and in the last like five birthdays, we haven't even been able to pull that off successfully. Yeah. So obviously, it's gonna be what what the group is used to. But as far as the kid, if you missing the birthday for you know for the kids. When I was sake. a kid, you know what I used to pick because that, that used to be in my family too. We get to like pick dinner. You know what I used to pick? Yeah, what? chicken patties. Dang, chicken oh, patties. Yeah, for dinner, from chicken where? Patties. Oh, just from the store. From the store. <laughs> just get some chicken patties. I used to love yeah. those things. Dang, yeah, yeah. I remember in school, I went to Kaloa Elementary School. I used to love the chicken patties there. Yeah. They're dope. The chicken patties. I used kind of like chicken those. McNugget, but like a big flat chicken McNugget. Yeah, and I didn't even like, I didn't like steak until I was in the days <laughs> because cause we didn't have a lot of steak growing up because steak is expensive. Yeah, You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, especially that ribeye. Yeah, especially that ribeye. So we didn't have steak. We had chicken patties. Yeah, yeah. Tasted good to me. Pretty dope. So and sometimes, delicious. you know what else? Of course, you want McDonald's when you're seven. Sure. Yeah, let's go let's get some fries and a shamrock shakey. <laughs> <laughs> we try. I, sure. I, had, I had told, because, you know, I love mint chocolate chip, right? Sure. So I had told all my kids about the, the original mint chocolate chip milkshake was the shamrock shake at McDonald's back in the day. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which they'd have around St. Patty's Day, which, by the way, isn't around my birthday, but it just made, came to my mind. Yeah, yeah. So... So when I was a kid, we had shamrock shakes. St. Patty's Day, they're mint shakes. And when I was a kid, they were amazing. Yeah. And I was so, and I hadn't had one in 30 years, maybe more, maybe 40 years. Mm -hmm. Hadn't had a shamrock shake. And I saw a little advertisement. I said, oh, kids, guess what? These are like mint chocolate chip milkshakes, but there's no chocolate chip. So it's just smooth mint, mint ice cream milkshake. Dang. Um, from McDonald? Yep. And I sent my daughter out to go get us all. Go get us all shamrock shakes. Mm. Brought them home. They were disgusting. Dang. They were nothing like what they used to be. Yeah, yeah. So McDonald's, I gave you a shot. Sorry, bro. Yeah. I'm surprised you gave him a shot. Um, I am too, but it's been 40-something years be since I yeah. had a shamrock shake, and I remembered them. Yeah, so yeah. I figured we'll go with it. Maybe they they're were going disgusting. For, yeah, they're probably going no, Not even my kids liked them. Not even my eight-year-old, who just you know is an eight-year-old that just looks at right. things and say that's ice cream. I yeah. want it. Yeah, she didn't yeah. even like it. None no. of them. No one. We all, they were disgusting. We threw them all away. Dang. So don't waste your money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't waste your money. Yeah, don't waste your money on McDonald's. That's my personal recommendation. Yeah. Period. Shamrock Shake or otherwise. Or otherwise. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's not help. Not help. Not helping you in any way. 
did you know that they just, I mean, this is going to sound obvious now that I'm saying it out loud. They add the green coloring to it, mm. to the ice cream, yeah. to make it green. Well, yeah, yeah. Like, so we, when you get briars, it's white. Yeah. I briars have been talking to is white. Me and uh, my wife and whatever family, the family goes to, uh, or the Oregon coast. That's where the Tillamook mm. cheese factory is. Mm-hmm. Wait, cheese factory? Yeah, yeah. Tillamook cheese the The actual big factory. Mm-hmm. And you can go on little tours and they give you ice cream. I'm like, okay, I want that mint mint chip, of course. Mm-hmm. And what they give it to me there? and they hand it to me. I'm like, the first time I see it, I was like, hey, that's not mine. That's obviously just the regular chocolate yeah, that's chip. vanilla chocolate yeah, chip. Don't you want know? it over here. And I for real said that. I was like, oh, I ordered the mint. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's mint. And then yeah. it all kind of came to me like, oh, yeah, I'm pretty dumb. for. for if you get Briars, Briars is white. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is the preferred brand to be quite honest with you no is it okay all right cool. well at least the ones that, that i've one, tried but hey, man, at cool. least the ones that i've tried yeah so so back to the birthday thing if you miss you, the birth of your child technically you're right technically for the question because i'm talking about like how upset or how much oh, is it the gonna kid's mean? not affected at, like, all. at all really but here's the thing it, if it like as a cohesive family that might be a thing if you have the option i'm saying if you're overseas come, come on man let's face it that that's a yeah. legit you know but if you have the choice so you miss the birth of your child that's more of like a family thing mm-hmm. like okay you, but that's not what that's not the question because so is the the first birthday the first year birthday that's kind of a, it's for the adults yeah it's for the, so the, the other first, people second third fourth and fifth oh uh, not the fourth and By in the my fifth, experience maybe they're in the game a little bit yeah. Yeah. It depends on the kid, what you I should guess. do is condition them that they don't expect anything good. <laughs> yeah, I guess. You know. Yeah, life sucks, man. Life sucks. Nothing special about your stupid birthday. Every there's a bunch of people born that day, that day. A bunch of people born tomorrow. A bunch of people born yesterday. Get over yourself, kid. Concur. F- four years old. I know a bunch of people who turn four. <laughs> anyway, uh, agree. I think that age two, all the way to. 21 that's my opinion those are ones that if they want you there you you, you i don't make think that you, i don't think your you daughter's can. gonna want you around at her 21st birthday she better down Otherwise. in cabo <laughs> <laughs> why are you gonna say that bro? Uh, she's not allowed in cabo she's not allowed check we got anyway, time for one more yeah we'll one more jocko what do you think about when you don't feel like getting after it you know I put this out the other day and I think it's important all right so Rome wasn't built in a day we all know that everyone hears that but Rome also didn't fall apart overnight either it took hundreds of years for Rome to reach its peak But it also took time, hundreds of years, for Rome to decay and fall apart. And that is representative of life. Because you don't achieve worthwhile goals quickly or easily. They take time. They take struggle. They take relentless pursuit day in and day out that's what it takes but also things don't usually fall apart quickly either at least at first it it's it's a slow process a little slip here a little setback over there a little wearing down of discipline and will over time that's the thing success and failure are generally slow processes either slowly building things up or gradually tearing them down And that's why I say you've got to pay attention. You have to watch. You have to watch every single second. Be 
because those seconds they turn into minutes and minutes turn into hours and hours turn into days and days turn into years and so that second that second that just went by that counted and so did that second and so did that one and in those precious seconds you were either building or you were decaying you were either gaining ground or you were losing ground in that second and in every second Every second counts. So make every second count. And I think that's all I've got for tonight. So echo if people want to make it count for this podcast maybe you could tell them how they can go ahead and do that if they want to sure be happy to actually we're talking about origin why did Pete choose origin as the name he told the story right (coughs) must be slacking on the listening on that one nonetheless it makes sense because The origin of all these, all the gear is here in the U.S. Just happens to be, but that's a big thing, the origin. So what do we make geese out of? Say cotton, you know, okay, we'll just take the cotton, grow the cotton in the U.S. What do they do with the cotton? Turn it into yarn. They do, yeah, yeah, stuff. Dye it. Yeah. Turn it into a fabric. Oh, yeah, yeah various forms yeah <laughs> and they do all of that they don't import it you no. know from wherever no. you know some right undisclosed here. american place. hands yeah anyway so maybe that's why it's called origin because the origin is a significant thing mm-hmm. right sure. anyway all right cool so origin what is origin origin is the best gear in the world straight up objectively not subjectively objectively i got proof boom so i got a gi we went to this origin immersion camp for jiu-jitsu origin Jiu-Jitsu immersion camp. Yep. Good fun, by the way. That was your first time in the Origin Gi, wasn't it? Yes, at oh, the camp. Check. Yeah. Yeah, I saw you with yours. <laughs> it was cool. Um, yeah, so cool. Camp, got the Gi. Um, then I come home. Got two, by the way. Actually, I got two Gi tops. One pair of pants. Um, come home. Made me want to train more in the gi, by the way. I, thought, I don't know if it was the gi or the camp or mm, both. Probably, probably, both. probably both, yeah. Anyway, so this whole week I trained gi. And every single time I went in, someone mentioned the gi. And it's not like it's pink or something no. like that when they're like, hey, Just see, Echo put gi. on his gi. Yeah, it's normal. You can get the blue gi. I, had the, I have the white one. And everyone was like, oh, what's that? Jeff Glover was one of them. <laughs> and this is the person who's like, you know, if he says it, it's something. It's not like some, you know, fashion person. Is, I don't like that logo or that's a cool, you know. Anyway, it was someone who knows geese. Anyway, everyone asking, like, what up with this geese? Like, going to the spiel made here. I might have lost somebody because it took real long saying it, but <laughs> nonetheless, it's dope. And then another one was Jeff Higgs. We know who that is. Higgsy. Do you know who that is? I sure do. Yeah, yeah. The person that Jocko talks about when he first started to get introduced to jujitsu. The guy who reintroduced to jujitsu. Yeah, he and I got introduced to jujitsu together. Mm. Then he went out and trained hard. Yeah, I think it was the day he got his purple belt. His purple. I was the white belt. I mean, we trained with Master Chief Bailey overseas mm-hmm. that for like three months, mm. and then we came back. We were in different platoons, but he started training for yeah. real with Fabio Santos. Yeah, and the day he got his purple belt. I'm pretty sure it was the day he got his purple belt. He came to my house mm. and was like, let's go train. And I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> cool. 
So think about purple belt versus white belt. He just annihilated yeah. me. Yeah. And he, you know, triangle, arm lock, yeah. ma- you know, everything. Rear yeah. naked choke. And, and he's yeah. kind of tall, too. Yeah, uh, he's he tall, just strong. Putting beat down. Bony. Bony. Like, in terms of when he's impacting you with his elbows. Yeah, bony. yeah. Real bony. He's hitting you. Yeah, he's got the bones. Yeah. Cutting. Yeah, he's like I guess a, triangle um, feels like it's going to cut your head off. Because <laughs> he's bony. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he knows some good judo too, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's and he and he's got a real, he's got a real. Um, he's always in touch with the whole idea of using this to effectively defend yourself in a street scenario. Yeah. He's always in touch with that. Yeah, he always adds in a little. And if you're in the street, you could do this right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. did that. I went up to Studio Five Forty. Yeah. Uh, oh. Uh, for very straight. I had to train at 10 a.m. I had some stuff I had mm-hmm. to do, and then they were only doing nogi at the V. So Studio 540. Higgs is teaching the class. Rob Zepps, he's the owner yep. or whatever. Even he mentioned the gi. Dang. He was like, well, he's like, what gi is this? Yeah. Well, it's because it's a different material, specially, not only specially made, specially woven, specially designed for yeah. jujitsu. Yeah. So yeah. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's that origin stuff. Don't worry about that. And he's like, Oh he's like, I think I might have one you know, he's the kind with like yeah. one thousand yeah. He's like, I think I have one of these or whatever. And I was like, You don't have this one, bro. And I just <laughs> kept walking, you know. <laughs> anyway, then afterwards it was afterwards when Higgs was like, he's like, This is the I think he even said this is the most interesting gi and he was like rubbing it in his yeah. fingers, you know, when he grabbed my sleeve. Said, this is the most interesting gi yeah. I've ever seen. Something like that, you know, went yeah. into my That's shield. the axiom. Gi yeah, yeah, yeah. With That's the gorilla it. weave. Yeah. Because they have a normal pearl weave, which yeah. looks like little tiny pearls. Sure. Right? Yeah. Well. American pearl. But the axiom, that gorilla weave, mm-hmm. is, is, or is it the dragon weave? They the, both look very similar. Yeah. But they're both we, cool. Yeah. One of them looks like, um, like it's like, <laughs> I'm not going to say velvet. I'm not going to do that, but it looks like that, you know? No, it looks like diamonds. Which one was the yeah. one? I remember we were looking at them and uh, we were lo- and they were saying like, like I was like, dang, this looks super luxurious. That's not the one I have, by the way. Hmm. It was like this uh, the other one. I don't know which one was which, but nonetheless, people seem to like the <laughs> geek. And the pants are dope. It has the, it's like, you can choose drawstring, but it has the, um like, you know, like surf shorts yeah um, where they have the Velcro boom yeah. and it's like fitted. They go in sizes like of your waist. It's yeah. not just like, uh, which actually I'm not against the whole A1, A2, A3, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not against that. It's actually, it's fine. It's cool. Super mm-hmm. simple. Um, but this is good. It's like when you get it, you can order your pants size. Mm-hmm. Boom. <laughs> so, you know, when you put it on, it's going to be dope. Anyway, and it is dope. And, you know, the public uh, responded in that way as well. So, oh, also. And rash guards, T-shirts. Yeah. We're going to make a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's some cool stuff on there. And the point is really, sure, I'm talking about the gi. Why? Because I was all up in that gi this week. <laughs> and that's fresh on my mind. And it's, you know, one of those things that sticks in there. Um, also, at the camp, um, you know how, like, when you give your laundry? I only had yeah. that one. Yeah. So you give your laundry, you, you're out of gi. You can't go to the next session unless you get another gi, which yeah. is kind of, I, I wasn't really about that. But so I would use them twice in a row and they dry surprisingly fast. It's not even a surprise. They dry fast. They're not 100% cotton. Yeah. They got polyester, I think, well, in there with silver coated. They, no, I'm not kidding. It's antimicrobial silver coating on it. Yeah. Not like silver, you can see it. Yeah. But yeah, that's why. Silver, that's the thing. That's the same thing with mine. When I pulled mine, when I pull mine out of the washing machine after the spin cycle, it's almost yeah. dry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a pair of sheriff shorts, basically. Yeah. But dang, it feels comfortable. It's nice, yeah. So yeah, man. Anyway, so yeah, or origin Maine, like the state Maine, mm-hmm. not M A I N, M A I N E. So originmaine dot com. Go on there. There's a, a lot of cool stuff on there, man. A lot of it. Um, so yeah, check that one out. That's the best gear in America, all made. In America, best gear in the world, all made America. Also, Jocko has some supplements. So, still on OriginMain.com, right? There's a part, and I was because I was looking for them. Yep. You go on the top, yep. and it says Labs. Yep. You click on there, boom. That's where all the supplements. Super Krill, because mm-hmm. normal you Krill. Mean, you mean Jocko Super Krill? Jocko <laughs> Super Krill. You couldn't just do the Krill oil, huh? No. You couldn't. No, well, no, no, no. I impossible. got Super Krill. Yeah, super krill. Why why get krill when you can get super mm. krill? One of those deals. Super krill's got the capes on. 
All right, cool. There you go. And, you know, um, joint warfare, which is, you know, a blend of joint Supplements. refurbishing. Yeah, yeah. Furbishing. Is furbishing a word? You know, refurbishing. refurbishing, right? Yeah. But the refurbishing is just doing it again, right? Yeah. Is it fur- furbishing? Yeah. Kind of thing? Oh. And that's got the things that I always take. Yeah. Glucosamine, so- curcumin, um, chondroitin, and the chondroitin is in the form of sea cucumber. Sweet. That's where it comes from. Sweet. So, yeah. Well, the it's legit. The inter- not interesting, I guess you could call it layers, is this is exactly what you were taking for years. Yeah. And you were like, hey, guess what? Origin in the house. Let's just make that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes I'd have to combine different things before. Yeah. But now I don't have to combine anything anymore. Oh, they're already combined. We're, we're combining it. Yeah. Joint we're going to combine it into one uh, yeah, pill. Yeah, one deal, yeah. Boom. There it's you go. warfare. Joint warfare. Against, <laughs> against joint weakness. Yep. It's a good idea, too, by the way, because now I got two kids. Remember when I, I told the story, like, you know, when you wake up yeah. and my daughter. Yes, you've told that story many three, times. Yeah, I'm going to tell yeah. it again. So oh, she used to man. jump on my back when I get up. <laughs> you know, when you're right, when you wake up, that's your least warm. That's when you're trying to warm up and get, do physical stuff. The least warm you'll ever be just in everyday life is when you wake up. Yeah, those first 12 burpees are, are hard when you Yeah, get or before you do the burpees that <laughs> moment so this is the exact moment when my daughter mm, you know 40 pounds or so jumped on my back my shoulders my back or my shoulders whatever she chose and you know after i took krill for i think it was like five six days boom i could easily do it. i didn't have to like focus on my form nothing like that now i got two kids and my daughter who's older is heavier mm-hmm. so not this morning yesterday morning I go to wake her up for school or whatever. I already have my son. He weighs, I don't know how much he weighs, but he's one. I have him. She still wants to jump on my shoulder. I have him because he's like, oh, oh, and then he sees her jumping. So so basically, I'm the, what do you call it? The vehicle that they're riding on. Early in the morning, by the way. Still no problem. Still going strong. So yeah, man, that's it. That's a joint warfare uh, situation right there. And krill, super krill. Get on it. You'll be glad you did. Also, check out onit.com slash Jocko. This is where I get my kettlebells. And I I, meant, I mentioned this. I got the gorilla ones, 72 pounds. So I'm cruising, right? Not lifting, cruising. And Jade comes. My brother comes. And I was like, I was like, yeah, go check out those new kettlebells I got. And he goes, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are cool. I was like, go ahead and pick them up. He goes, I'm picking that. <laughs> like kind of heavy, you know? But I've been doing kettlebells. So I was like, nah, let me show you. Not even warmed up nothing speaking Boom. of krill oil yeah it was actually warfare. really the krill oil fucking springing into action <laughs> really <laughs> boom i do it and um you know had to show him what up nonetheless that was done with those kettlebells which are dope by the way um i'm not gonna say get the designer ones i'm not gonna say that i think you should <laughs> but i'm not gonna say to do that i say go on there on it dot com Slash Jocko, check it out. You like something, get something. They got cool battle ropes and any kind of exercise stuff, like the new stuff, functional training, equipment, keep your workout interesting. If you care about your workouts being interesting, unlike Jocko. (laughs) Jocko doesn't care about that stuff. Um, Don't get addicted to the interesting information like I did. I think I'm past that addiction now, but, um, you know, you do run that risk on it. Dot com slash Jocko. That's a good one. Also, good way to support is when you're buying these books at Jocko Reviews. We didn't review one today, but, you know, in the future, Jocko might and it has in the past. Um, I we organize these books by episode on JockoPodcast.com. Go on the top. Click on books from podcast. Boom. All in order. To support the podcast, click through there to get them. Boom. It takes you to Amazon. Supports the podcast that way. Also, if you're doing any other shopping, hey, feel free. If you're going to buy a new video camera in the event of your video camera breaking on the plane, (laughs) when you check your luggage and the video camera's in there, you want to get another one, boom, get it through there. All good. Big, uh, Big support on that one. What? (laughs) It seems like an opportune time to talk about your other video camera. Sure. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Or maybe not. Actually, it's a good story, though. Yeah. It's not like a tragic story, which it kind of felt like when you mentioned it. I was like, oh, it brought me back. Okay, so here's a story. We go to Maine, right? Technically, we go to Boston, then yep. drive to Maine. Yep. Right, so you know, to to, dr- to drive to Maine, we rent a car. Well, you know, the car rental place, and I have three bags. Well, you have what? One, two. Yeah, two bags. Two bags. So five my, bags my total. My computer bag and my suitcase. Yeah. So five bag. bags total. I have a big bag with equipment in it. Suitcase with you know all, all, jiu-jitsu. all your jujitsu stuff and clothes and whatnot. And then the third bag, which was a carry-on, bit pretty big. You know, most important. Most kind important of. has a um, it has an important camera in there that I use. It's my my favorite camera I have ever had. Really good camera. Uh, has some value to it, we'll say. And it's a red camera. Yeah, it's, it's red, a red epic. Camera. Yeah, epic W technically. Red epic W. Yeah, it's it's a awesome camera. Is it the best you can buy? Or is there one more? It depends on what you mean by best, but it's it. Yeah, there's one sort of level. Up, okay, well is, I'll tell you this: it ain't cheap. No, it ain't cheap at all. In some places in the country, you could buy a house for the cost of this camera. Yeah, yeah. So it's an expensive camera. Yeah, and and you'd think like okay. Echo's going to take really good care of this yeah, thing. Yeah, <laughs> which I do. Really, that's why I carry it on. Yeah. And boom, boom, you he know. He doesn't even trust anyone touching it. He's going to carry it with him. Yeah. Okay, continue. So, boom, we Keep get in the in rental mind. car. We got apparently got five bags to account for. Uh, was there, there was no, there was some kind of confusion. You there know what happened? No yes, there was. Yes, remember? Because remember when you we were getting in, what was it, like an expedition or yeah. something like that? And now those new ones have that automatic tail yeah. door that goes up. Yeah. And you know what it was? I think there's like a sensor under the bumper mm-hmm. that if you like put your foot under there, it, oh, closes. it closes. Like if you know, like a hands-free closing the yeah. door situation. So the thing started closing, closing on me. On Jocko, yeah. And the girl, the rental girl, was trying to save me. Yeah. And she couldn't. <laughs> yeah. So it, <laughs> it was, was like too a, strong you know, for her, which was kind of funny because yeah. I didn't even care. And I just kind of like put my back into it and it stopped. Yeah. But I was watching her kind of chuckling because she's trying to stop it and it wasn't yeah. stopping. Yep. It was. She was looking and she had a look on her face like I was about to die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you straight up. Work, you know? <laughs> like yeah. Indiana Jones, I was going to get my head cut off <laughs> by yeah. the door slamming shut. Yep. And I was just kind of like laughing at the whole situation. Yeah. But that caused some confusion apparently it was in like your li- mind. It was like a little micro emergency. Okay. That <laughs> happened and so i was like boom flustered but wait what all the bags are in or not and we were trying to fit remember because we you were trying to get the seats down yeah, anyway there's yeah. like maybe three quasi major things going on <laughs> no 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 one. major things going on but <laughs> and yeah, you know for the sake of the story i'm just going to continue so boom, Please we do. get it all 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 loaded. i apologize to everyone for asking we for get it all Michael. loaded and at one point, like we were like halfway up. This is a three hour drive, yep. by the way, if yep. we don't stop. And we did stop. Yep. So it was like five hours or something like that. So we stopped. And I remember, hey, we I stopped and got we... fried chicken, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. <laughs> it really, was really good. I, I, love, I loved good. it. Yeah, I was stoked. Nonetheless, I th- had a thought, and it was literally it lasted three seconds. Like, I don't really remember putting my camera bag in the car. But what am I going to do? Not put it in the car? Yeah. It's like the most important bag. So whatever. So we just continue. We get up there, and right as we pull into like park, like now we're talking five like four we hours start. later. We're yeah. in the back country of Maine. Yeah, like not even knowing. Yeah. First time there, by yeah. the way. Which I don't know what that even means, but either way, we're there. And I'm all pumped up. Yeah, I was even though I couldn't roll because my rib, I was stoked to go in and see everybody yeah. and hang out. Yeah, you can see everyone you can see rolling. Everyone, everyone's inside the light of the gym. Yeah, so they can't see that we're outside. Yeah, so I'm all, but I'm stoked. So it's yeah, the beginning of the the deal, the whole the thing. adventure, yeah. if you will. And um, right as we kind of roll to a stop, I'm thinking, man, did I? You know, how you kind of account. We're here, and yeah. now you start to account for it. And I don't remember that stuff. So the first thing I do, I look in the back seat because that's where it would have went. Not there. And I look in the back, not there. And you know, you get that cold feeling that just rushes over your body. Like, yeah. oh my God. So I'm like, man. So whatever I tell you. And you're like, oh, you know, get on the phone, you know, call the airport. And bro, you ever tried calling the airport yeah, for I, something? I was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I told you this afterwards. My opinion was at that point, I was like, that thing's gone. hundred percent. Gone. 99 gone. Po- gone. 
Yeah. 99.999% you're never going to see that thing again. I had already cut it away emotionally and detached <laughs> from it. And I, and I was kind of throwing you bones like, oh, yeah, yeah call the airport. Yeah. Maybe they can help you. That was you know? actually nice of you. Because yeah. like, you really, you seem like you care, not necessarily about the camera necessarily, but you cared about me. Yeah, you know, I like I really. <laughs> I thought that thing was gone. There's no chance you're getting it back. Get over it. Yeah. And I was a little bit, well, I said, you know, is there podcast recorded that you don't have copies of on there? Yeah. And you said, no, they're all uploaded. I was like, good thing. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Because we're never going to see that thing again. Yeah. And I was thinking I'll see it again in three months, maybe, when they finally recover it <laughs> from Lost and Found from the Boston airport, by the way. Yeah. Um, or I get my insurance money for it down the line, and then yeah. I got to go re- go through the purchase Big process, hassle. which yeah. is a thing. Big gut check. And, but we don't have it for this trip, for sure. And later on, I... I found out or realized that we have the podcast like SD cards in there so well we I guess we could have just bought some anyway nonetheless yeah. we get there and I'm calling the airport and right when the airport recording picks up yeah, I just get this feeling like oh my gosh I'm just completely going through the motions right yeah. now no one's gonna pick up and be like sure I'll look for it yeah I got it no one that's yeah. not gonna happen but I keep calling. I'm like, I'm not going to be the guy who didn't do everything I can. So I'm calling or whatever. Meanwhile, we got to go talk to Pete. We got to, yeah. you know, all this stuff. And actually, you released me. You go, hey, man, go ahead. Yeah, I'll yeah. make these calls. And I was like, okay, cool. You hang out. Yeah. And just make this <laughs> totally worthless effort because yeah. you're never seeing that thing again. I'll go hang out with people. Yeah. So after like a few minutes of that, I go in. I'm like, you know what? Let me, whatever. Let me d- kind of cut it away as yep. you say. And let me at least embrace the, you know, what we're doing. Go in. And you kind kind of casually, in a way, mentioned like, "Hey, there's some guys from the the police department." If that came here. across casually, I, casually, I shouldn't have made it come across because I met a bunch of guys. You know, everyone saying hi, and a couple guys. You know, yeah, we're we're cops and Revia down in Massachusetts, and you know, right by Boston. Yeah, right next to it. And and I'm, I met them, and, and 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 then you strolled back in, and you met a couple people. And then I said, did you talk to anybody? Well, yeah, I talked to this, and you know, they're going to look, whatever. I'm thinking, yeah, things gone. And I said, you know, if there's anyone in the world that could like make something happen right now, it's cops. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's it's co- Boston cops, Revia cops. And, you know what I and, thought? And I just said, I said, bro, and I was a little, this is my ego. I was embarrassed for you. I, yeah, I, I felt you- bad that you had to go and tell somebody that you lost this. Yeah sick camera and so I just said hey man those guys over there they're cops and if there's anyone that's gonna get this thing back it's them yeah and I'm thinking you know the, the whole story where like did you not see see this so did you not think that they were gonna be able to help I, I thought that they'd be like oh you lost your bag like <laughs> everyone does every single day at yeah. that airport oh we're cops bro we have crimes to solve yeah, no. Well, I'm I, not gonna I, go get your stupid. My bag. attitude of that thing being gone actually changed as soon as I connected. I said to myself, "Oh, they're cops. We're gonna we're gonna turn this Dang. over to them, and they well, can make things happen." Yeah, that, that that's <clears> good. <throat> and you and even me when I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna mention it to these cops," and these cops are gonna be like, "Diva, like what? What do you think our job is? You know, to go recover your lost luggage? Like d- three hours away? By the yeah, way, yeah. no. So I'm like, you know what? Jocko said to do it. I'm just gonna do it. This is another go through the motions thing. So. I kind of timidly go, Dennis and Nate, yeah. they were there, they just rolled or whatever, and I was like, yeah, I lost the bet. And they were like, "Like, what did it look like? Like, they kind of were into it. I was yeah. like, oh, this is promising, you know, like, <clears throat> they actually care, because I was thinking they'd be like, man, that's a sad story, bro. I'm going to go talk to Jocko again, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> I thought that was going to happen. And they were like, no. Bro, they get on the phone, yeah, and they're like, "What did it look like? Boom. One more question. Like, well, where, where'd you leave it? Okay, boom. Back on the phone. Back on the phone. These two guys. I'm like, oh, this is, it's starting to kind of look up. And he's like, okay. So they hang up the phone. He's like, just a waiting game now. Just a matter of time. I got this. I got this guy. I'm like, for real? They're like, yeah, man. Just waiting game. Bro, they so said, we're talking. They called, they called all their bros out there. And there was like a force of troopers Bro. went down there to get in there. Had that thing recovered in what? 20 minutes. 20 Hugs minutes. Us, yeah. So we, they hang up and they're like, just a matter of time, bro. And w- then we just start talking about other stuff. Yeah. You know, kind of teasing me a little bit, whatever. I deserve it. Probably <laughs> even 10 times that. But, and then we, we're talking about other stuff. Boom, his phone rings. He's on it. He's like, is it a mind shift bag and all this uh, describing it? I don't even know. That's yeah. how out of time. I'm like, yeah, I think so. Go inside and he's, uh, and, he, and he busts out my laptop or whatever. It's matching the description. And in my mind, I'm like, there's no way he found it. <laughs> 
Like a cop's not going to just roll into the Logan Airport yeah. and find my bag. No way that's going to happen. But oh, it happened. sure enough, he's like, oh, yeah, frag mob, because it has a frag mob sticker yeah. on my on my uh, laptop. He's like, frag mob. I was like, that cold feeling turned into just warmth <laughs> and love and rainbows on these guys. I was like, that's the one. They were like, and, you know, they're kind of, they didn't actually high five, but they're kind of like almost like, you know, this was this little task. They kind of bonded together and just like that, man. 20 minutes, man. It. <sighs> And then some, and then one. Who drove it up? Um, Robbie. Yeah, I'm pretty, that's his name, right? Robbie. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I owe him a roll. Um, actually, there was another guy, Callahan, who was the guy who went and grabbed. So it was like a, a coordinated deal, man. Yeah. And um, man, that was like the one of the more heroic things that has happened to me in the in the recent past. <laughs> So you got the camera back. Got the camera back. And the computer. Yeah. And we're good. So in the event, so the point is, in the event of you shopping for cameras, you can't get a red camera on Amazon, but if you want to get like a Sony HD Handycam, you know, or whatever you're using because it broke in the luggage. I'm not saying that happened to me. I'm just saying if that ever happens, you want to get another one, boom, you can go through there, jockostore.com, click through. And um, th- thanks to everyone that got that camera back. Yeah. Much appreciated, and the laptop with all kinds of videos and important stuff on it. Yeah, actually, there's you guys really rocked on the laptop, but but yeah, man, Dennis and Nate, the primary guys, Mr. Callahan. I didn't meet him, but he's done he for the cause. Happen. You recovered that, <laughs> and then Robbie, I owe you a roll. I owe you two rolls. I owe you a lot, man. Yeah, You're the man, he's the one who delivered it. So big up to all of them, big time. So, also back to support. Of Jocko Podcast. Subscribe to the podcast. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. It's a good way to support. Kind of kind of kinda of obvious, like, oh yeah, you subscribed already, but some people maybe they didn't. Maybe they're just kinda of maybe wish not wish wash, but you know, kind of still on the fence. But yeah, man, do it. Pull the trigger. You can unsubscribe if we're not delivering value. I don't like to use that expression, adding value, because mm-hmm. everyone uses it, thinks it's cool. I thought it was cool. Nonetheless, if we're not adding value, you can unsubscribe if you want. Also, subscribe on YouTube. What's the recent development? Oh, your book? Mm-hmm. Discipline, Discipline equals, equals freedom. freedom. Field manual. Field manual, which you'll talk about later. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we put a video on there. Kind of little summary. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was know. real excited to see that video come out. Yeah. And I was, we, you, you know, we were texting back and forth. And you said, well, how about, you know, we we'll, I'll put it out tomorrow, but it's ready. And I said, just put it out now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Late and night. then you said launching in three, two, and then there was, and I went to my YouTube on my phone and I was uh, refreshing, refreshing, <laughs> refreshing, refreshing, sure. refreshing. And I wanted to catch it, like the first person to catch it. I'm right. refreshing, refreshing. And this happened. I got a ping from my mail mm-hmm. on my phone and I switched to mail and it said, Jocko podcast has uploaded a new video <laughs> So that's one of the benefits of subscribing to the YouTube channel if something comes out You can have it email you if you want it to if you, you can have it email you when something new comes out and otherwise There's no way you'd know. Yeah, so if you if you care about that kind of stuff um, Which you know, it's one of those deals where yeah, sure you get the video version of the podcast If you care what we look like Just fine Actually, people play it on their TV, like in their little home gym or something yeah. like that, which, which is cool. It's kind of like we're all there together, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, some excerpts in there. The video that you made for the book, Yeah. I think it might be your best video ever. It might be. I think it's up there, man. I was, yeah, I was talking. It's real good. I was talking to somebody on Facebook, and they are like, oh, hey, that video is cool. And I thought about, I was like, oh, I was like, yeah, man, thanks for that. But I thought about, I was like, wait, Jocko kind of did all the work, really. <laughs> you know, you're the one working out your words, you saying the words. I said, all I did was put some cool music and some words on yeah, there. I, yeah, but you made all that other stuff happen, and there are the words and the way it's all coordinated together and all that stuff. So put some lights on there. Mm. Nonetheless, you know what? Um, to be honest, I'm, I like how it came out too. Yeah, it was good. You it's very, it, very. You think indicative. it might be the best one? I, hey, man, you know, it depends on what you mean by best. You know. I don't know. Impactful. Impactful. Sure. It's a good one. I liked it. Yeah. It was. Uh, but if good. someone wasn't subscribed to the YouTube channel, yeah, they might not never know that that video exists. That's true. And that 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 hurts. Or no Facebook, or no Twitter, or no nothing. So, yeah. Yeah. So choose your 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 well. Battles I or tweeted that one out, but I don't always tweet out when something comes out. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, yeah, I don't always do that. 
Sure. So if you subscribe, you'll know, regardless yeah. of what my actions are. That's true. And, you know, choose whether or not you want an alert. You know, sometimes you don't want that alert every single time, but sometimes you do, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll put some deleted scenes on there as well. Anyway, nonetheless, yeah, YouTube channel. We have one, and it's cool. I think it's cool. Jocko thinks it's cool. Mm, I just got a little thing. YouTube kind of changed their look on YouTube. I don't know if you noticed that. Well, I, it's hard for me to judge because I have YouTube red now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no the ads. Oh, the red. It's so dope. Nonetheless, it I like is. the ads. Ads. Actually, the, they did good a good thing with the ads now. Now you can click, like, I don't like this ad, or oh. you can give that. So you can kind of narrow down the ads you see. Mm. I like the movie trailer ads, mm -hmm. you know? like I don't yeah. like any ads. Yeah, I, I want to watch what I want to watch. Everyone else get away from me. Yeah, yeah, I dig it, man. I dig it fully. Well, nonetheless, point there is subscribe, subscribe to the YouTube channel is a good way of supporting the podcast if you want to. Also, Jocko is a store. It's called Jocko Store. JockoStore.com, of course. Very creative name. By the way, I guess technically I came up with the name. Yeah, you did. Just store. It's yeah. your store, Jocko store. I concurred with the name. Yeah. So what do we have on the store? If you don't know already, we've got shirts on there, rash guards, travel mugs, some bumper stickers, patches, hats, ball cap hats. Not like. Did you bring mine today? Top hats. You no. don't look like you did. Yeah, no, I didn't bring <laughs> yours. Sorry, bro. You owe me nine. <laughs> Yeah. Nonetheless, they're on there. JockoStore.com. I guess technically you could go to your own store and get a hat or nine hats, as the case may be. Okay, I'll do that today. Thank you. Yeah, Appreciate yeah. it. If you want, if you want to, um, some women's stuff on there. Some hoodies. We want to get a thicker hoodie. That's what we're doing, right? Yep. I know you said it before. Yep. A bunch of times. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we'll work on that. So there, boom, hoodies. Uh, mm, I think. What? What's the next move? What's the next thing? Winter hoodie. Winter hoodie. Yeah. Yeah. I think it should be. I think I'm going to put a warrior kid rash guard on there too for for warrior kids doing no gi jiu-jitsu. Or even gi. You know how you wear the rash guard under yeah. the gi sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that'd be dope. All cool. that stuff. Nonetheless, Jocko Store, that's where you get Jocko stuff. It's pretty cool. So I'm not saying to buy something. I'm saying go on there, check it out. If you like something, get something. Good way to support. Also, Psychological Warfare. If you don't know what that is, it is an album with tracks. Jocko tracks. It's Jocko saying stuff to you. So if you listen to it, it's not like a story, right? Like a lot, you know, a lot of times it's not music. Obviously, it's not Jocko singing hardcore, which you do from time to time, by the way. <laughs> You ever ride, and here's a kind of a rhetorical question, okay. Have you ever ridden, not you, Jocko, but the people out there, have you ever ridden with Jocko for five hours, three to five hours in a car? No? Okay. Let me tell you what it's like, part of what it's like. It's Jocko drumming, even in the airplane, by the way, drumming on, what do you call that, the handle in the door, mm -hmm. like you're doing like drums, <laughs> boom, 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 and then singing under his breath, hardcore stuff. Um, What else were you singing? <laughs> I don't I think even it was know. like Tom Petty or something. It wasn't Tom Petty. It was something. Anyway. I, I have no idea. Yeah, but it was songs. All I know is every, occasionally I'd look at you and you'd be looking like, can you please stop? Yeah, yeah. Which I got a kick out of. Maybe yeah, do yeah. it more. <laughs> yeah, or or stop the car and like get out or something. Yeah, you get out and walk. Yeah, yeah. I'm playing drums. That was the look for sure. Mm. Yeah. Wait, no. You get out. Stop playing drums and get out. <laughs> that was the look. Nonetheless, these tracks are not that. They're him, him, Jocko, talking to you, telling you pragmatic ways to get over your current weakness. What weakness? Okay, so let's say you're trying to stick to a good diet, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to wake up early or I'm, all I'm of the fasting, above. right at this moment, actually. Yeah, I'm currently. coming up on 48 hours right cur now. Currently. Yep. Feeling Dang. good, too. I guess technically I'm fasting, too, because I ate a salad. What at, I did? Oh. Hardcore workouts yesterday and today rolled last night 70% ribs a little tweaked still but Andy Dean light rolls a little bit with Nam I think that was it but yeah no fasting the whole time yeah yeah, yeah. dang yep so technically am I fasting if I ate a salad at like 11:45 last night well yeah and that was it I yeah. drank some coffee yeah fasting yeah, right yeah, yeah. fast 24 hour fast no right now. 
Oh, 12 hour fast. No, yeah, not yeah. fasting. No, no. credit. Credit wait, removed. Wait. Is there such thing as an eight hour fast? I think that's just life, dude. When's the cu- <laughs> No, I, I think mean, it's like no, four and a half. If you're hours. not doing if you're not doing at least twelve hours. Okay, twelve hours is the cutoff for calling it intermittent. I don't know what the cutoff is, dude. I'm not a doctor. Yeah, but you're or even a you're, nutrition well, guy. Well, you're fasting right now currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if like you just didn't eat yet? And whatever. <laughs> then I just didn't eat yet. There's a yeah. difference. Well, yeah, so what's the difference? That's I don't the know. question. I don't know. All right. Hey, you're you're a man of humility. You say you don't know when you don't know. I like that. Nonetheless, back to psychological warfare. If you're trying to stay on the fast or wake up early every morning, you know, or stick to the diet, stay on the program, whatever, in whatever way, ways that you have opportunities to slip. This is an album with tracks that tell you why you shouldn't slip on your waking up early, your diet, your working out, my whole thing, you know, like I've said before, if I don't feel like working out, I kind of tend to be like, oh, maybe I'll rest today. Maybe I'll do it later. You know, that whole thing. Not good. Yeah, this helps with that. It'll just tell you like why. It'll, how in a nutshell, it tells you the benefits of not slipping and the repercussions of slipping. That's a good in a way pragmatic way. But it's Jocko telling it to you, so it works 100% of the time, my S- experience. Speaking of fasting, yeah. w- people ask me this all the time, when you're fasting, do you eat anything? Yeah. I do, actually. Sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds, because it takes you like 37 minutes to have one little tiny seed to get it chewed up. and uh, so it's. Right. But they're but they're good because they keep you occupied and you're chewing and they taste good and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll grab a handful of nuts. Just mix nuts. Just maybe one in the morning, mm. maybe one at night. Yeah, one handful, and Jocko white tea. Boom. That's the the things. Now sometimes I won't eat the nuts, but I don't know. I I, I, I I'm. You got to be careful that you don't have thirteen handfuls of nuts. Yeah, because that's but like I'm just talking like a handful of nuts, right? Um, but Jocko white tea, I have that for sure. And you know what? If you call me now or you want to put like, oh, you weren't really fasting because you have Jocko White tea and you had yeah. a handful of nuts. Yeah. And, I mean, if you think about the amount of calories that I burn on a daily basis, a handful of nuts is basically in, insignificant. But whatever, maybe I'm doing it wrong. That's yeah. okay. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not telling you to copy what I'm doing. I'm just telling you what I'm doing right now. Don't imitate me. Go find a professional to talk about fasting. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. Jocko okay. White tea, let me tell you, tastes good. Mm-hmm. Feels good and increases your deadlift about 12 fold Dang. or so. That's yeah, so that's real good for you. You can get it on Amazon. Also on Amazon, you can get some books, Extreme Ownership, Combat Leadership. I appreciate everyone that gets it for themselves and then gets it for their teams and sends pictures of 47 Extreme Ownership copies stacked up. I got something else for you. That's awesome. Get it for your business associates. Mm -hmm. people that you work with but they're not in your company you get it for them and that's going to improve everything in your world too because then they start taking ownership of problems and everything gets better Mm -hmm. so no and i've had a lot of people that have said hey i gave this to this person i gave this to this you know partner that i used to have and now he's got his own business but we're working together and i gave him the book and now we're working together even more Mm -hmm. so there's a good idea for you way of the warrior kid this is awesome at the origin camp a bunch of people from all over the Northeast brought their kids up to to meet, hang out, get a mm-hmm. signature and, and all that. And what's cool, this is what's cool, kids tell the truth. You know what I mean? They don't even, they're not aware of, they don't care about your feelings at all. Yeah, no. And it's awesome to, you know, say, I always say to a kid, oh, did you read that book? And they go, yes. And I go, how'd you like it? And they all say, oh, I love it, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. And we know you're Jocko <laughs> and thank you for writing it and those kids are getting stronger and smarter and tougher and better yeah. So you want to help out kids that you know get them this book right here Discipline equals freedom field manual That's what it is. It's a field manual for those of you that don't know what a field manual is in the military a field manual is the instructions on how to do something in the field whether it's attack a strong objective or whether it's do a reconnaissance or how to conduct a patrol the field manual gives you the instructions on how to do that and that's what this is the discipline equals freedom field manual is a field manual on how to implement discipline into your life there's zero amount of fluff in here 
<laughs> there's zero. Yeah. There, there's nothing in there that you, you're going to say to yourself, well, I think Jocko might have just thrown this in here for, you know, yeah, kind of yeah. take up some space in the pages. Didn't no. happen. Yeah, yeah. Rather not do it. Mm-hmm. Rather burn the whole book. <laughs> Don't care about that. The sure. book's not long enough. Cool. Read less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what it is. Get it from your local bookstore. So go down to the neighborhood bookstore and tell them you want this book. Or you can get it from Barnes & Noble. You can get it from Amazon. Let them know what's up. It's in the get after it section of your local bookstore. <laughs> yep. If they have one, if they don't have that section, they need it so they can put this one book by itself in there, yep. getting after it. Your video's awesome, by the way. Thanks, Jocko. Uh, for your business, if you need help aligning your leadership and improving the way that your whole team leads together, Check out our leadership and management consulting company. It's called Echelon Front. Me, Leif Babin, JP Dinell, Dave Burke. You can email info at echelonfront.com. Finally, the muster, September 14th and 15th. I'm pretty sure it's sold out by the time this podcast comes out. We've been able to squeeze a couple more people in at each of these. Even when we were sold out, we got in like four more people, three more people, seven more people. Check. It might be completely sold out, but extremeownership.com and it, if you want to we're going to pretty soon get the dates for the 2018 musters going so start looking to that and get registered as early as you can and until the muster if you happen to want to keep cruising with us kind of hard uh, we are on the interwebs on Twitter on Instagram and the uh, fishy boha echo is at echo charles and i am at jocko willink and finally to the military members out there sitting on some forgotten barricade holding the line to protect us thank you to the vets that stood on the wall and did their time Thank you to the police, law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs, other first responders. Thank you for what you do day in and day out. And to the rest of you with goals and dreams and aspiration, make sure you remember that seconds turn into minutes, minutes turn into days, and days turn into years. So make those seconds count. All of them. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.